What is up gamers, Fcast and Chill here. Today we're going to be talking about an, uh, the t raid Tombs of Amaska, and I'm going to be going in depth on how to do solo 400 level invocation raids. And this guide is going to be geared at people who do not have either a shadow or the yellow Karis Partisan, so if you don't have the yellow gym. Also, I, I do want to mention if you don't have a T-Bow, that's okay too. The Twisted Bow does help out here, but it's actually not a big deal over the Bofa. If you have a Bofa, that's totally fine, so don't worry about it. Um, then the target audience for this guide is going to be people who do have some TOA experience. They've probably you know, done several kill count with the raid, and maybe have the basics down, and are looking for ways that they can push the invocation level higher, and start working towards doing these solo 400s, since they're a very efficient way to get purples. So my goal with this is to play it safe and maximize purples per hour by minimizing deaths while still having the invocation level pretty high. I'm not trying to speedrun, there are ways to get these kill counts faster and you know change some things around and do things quicker, but they increase your risk of dying so I'm not going to be talking about that, that's not my, what my goal is here. And the reason I go with 400 level invocation is because that's where the formula starts scaling a bit slower for the purple rate. So up to 400, the purple chance increases very greatly as you increase your invocation level. Beyond 400, it starts to slow down a bit. So 400s are a really nice middle ground. Like once you do enough of them, they're pretty comfortable and laid back and you can go through and grind out a ton of purples very quickly. So before I get into actually the raid itself, I want to talk about some prerequisites that you should have. So the first thing is plugins. So in Rune Light, you want to make sure you have your true tile indicator turned on. This is going to be a tile that is on the um, ground that shows where your character actually is located at any point, because when you start running, your character model will lag behind your true tile a little bit. And so we're going to be using this true tile indicator a ton throughout the raid for some of the strategies. You also want to uh, um, turn on the plugin TOA points overlay. This is going to just show you your unique chance as you go through the raid. There's also a plugin called Tombs of Amaska that's extremely helpful. It helps out with a lot of the puzzles. There's even some things like it keeps track of the waves in the monkey room. I actually turned that off because I'm not a fan of it, but there's there's lots of good stuff here. Um, you also want to make sure on menu entry swapper, you do have shift click walk here selected. And this is so if you hold down shift on your keyboard and left click an enemy, it'll walk under them instead of attack them. Also, there are two options in your settings you want to make sure you have set up. So if you just go in the search bar and type control, you want to make sure you have control plus click to invert run mode always on. This means that if your um, you know, run energy is set to running and you hold control and click, it'll walk instead, and vice versa. If you have it set to where you're walking and hold control and click, it'll run instead. The other setting you want to make sure you have is the middle mouse button controls the camera. You definitely want to have this on. There's a lot of camera work that I like to do within this raid, and this can make it a lot easier. So definitely have this on. You can hold down your middle mouse wheel. and. Honestly, you should be doing this to change your camera up. Typically, it's a lot smoother than using the keyboard keys. So as for gear, this is my setup that I have here. Essentially, it's just my best in slot melee gear that I have. I don't have any Torva, so best melee gear along with a Bandos God Sword. Again, the Bandos God Sword isn't totally required, but it definitely does help out if you have one. Um, you do really need a fang though, the, the fang is extremely useful for this raid, especially as you push the invocation level higher. I wouldn't recommend doing 400s without a fang. But a lot of the information in this guide will still be relevant, even if you don't have a fang. So get, get all your best melee gear here. You can see that I have my crystal armor as well as my twisted bow and my bofa. And the reason I do this is because I don't have full Masori yet. So if you do have full Masori, feel free to swap out the three crystal armor pieces for Masori, and then you can swap out the Bofa for a blowpipe as well. But um, the Bofa actually works just fine. You don't need a blowpipe. I actually still don't have one on my account. Um, one thing I want to mention too is if you don't have a Twisted Bow, totally fine. You can drop it here for bringing another brew, maybe another prayer potion, or even bringing your blowpipe. You could do the Bofa and blowpipe combo if you'd like to. So really any of that'll work. 
Um, you'll want either the Claws or Void Waker if you have one of those. They're both pretty useful for just doing some burst damage, but again, not totally required. Then I'm bringing the Blade of Salador here. This is going to be pretty useful for the Warden um, when he's down in Phase 2 hitting the core. If you don't have the Blade of Salador, you can use the um, Rapier from Tob, or you could also use the Inquisitor's Mace. Those work just as well. And if you don't have any of those, then a Tent Whip should be okay too. It's not ideal, but the Tent Whip still gets the job done. And then in terms of Mage Gear, I only have my Trident here along with some of my best Mage Gear. I also bring the Book of the Dead for Thralls. If you have the Sanguinesti stuff, absolutely bring it. If you have a Shadow, of course bring it, but this guide is aimed for people who don't have a Shadow. Uh, and then I bring some potions. So I actually like to start here with, I bring only one brew, three prayer pots, and a Sandfew Serum. Um, you know, you depending on how much you flick during the raid, how good you are at prayer flicking, you could drop one of the prayer pots, maybe bring a second brew, or you could even pre-pot, like go ahead and sip your antidote plus plus here. And then once you sip that, then you can you grab another brew out of your bank to bring that in or something. I like to bring a 2-dose uh, Divine Super Combat as well as a 2-dose Ranging Potion as well. And so that's really it for the gear. Again, some of this stuff is flexible. It doesn't have to be like exactly like my setup, but this is what I like to go with. Here's my list of invocations that I use for my solo 400s. So you can see here I do have Hardcore Run on. I actually wouldn't recommend turning that on at first while you're learning. Maybe use Softcore Run instead because it can really eat into your bank having to pay 250k for each death. Again, I, I use walk for it, and I wouldn't necessarily use this when you're first learning because you might be a bit on the slower end and not make the 40 minute time every time. So yeah, um, those two are, you know, once you get a little bit of experience under your belt. Walk the path you definitely want to have on. It's a lot of points and is pretty free. Um, path Seeker, most people wouldn't recommend turning this on for doing speed TOA and farming purples. They would recommend using no help needed instead, but I'm actually not a fan of using the yellow Karis for comfy raids, and so I like to use Path Seeker. And I actually like Path Seeker because I like guaranteeing that my Baba is at least level 2, and I'll talk about that later. But um, yeah, I use Path Seeker. Deadly Prayers is fine too. You just need to be aware that when you do take damage, you'll lose a little bit of prayer as well, so keep an eye on that. On a diet, doesn't really matter. You're not going to be eating any food, just using potions to heal, so no problem there. For Kefri, you want to use these three invocations, Lively Larva, More Overlords, and Blowing Mud. The Lively Larva and Blowing Mud effectively don't really matter. Um, more Overlords, it can be a bit tricky, but we'll talk about that when we get to Kefri, but it's not too bad. And then Aerial Assault, I do turn on. This is kind of a preference sort of thing. Some people don't like it because they um, have Kefri at the end of Wardens, but I'm not someone who does that, so I'm going to keep it on here. For Zabok, we just keep all four invocations on, and don't worry, I'll be covering how to deal with Upset Stomach because it really is a pain in the ass. For Akka, I just use two invocations, Stay Vigilant and Feeling Special. Um, double trouble is doable and it's not too bad, but it requires you to focus a lot more. It's just less comfy, so I don't turn it on. Then for Baba and Wardens, I use every invocation here. And so that's really it for my invocations. Again, a lot of these are personal preference. You could swap things around. If you don't have enough experience yet and aren't comfortable doing hardcore run or walk for it, you could turn those two off and maybe turn on Pathfinder as, instead of Pathseeker, or you could even just you know, do 380s with those two off for a bit or whatever the hell, you know, the raid would be otherwise. And just, you know, get some practice in. But uh, that's it for the invocations. Now, there is one more thing I want to talk about before um, we dive into the raid, and that's the order, the boss order. So my, my order is a bit unconventional. I do Zabok first and Baba last. So the order I do the bosses is Zabok, Kefri, uh, then I do Akka, and then Baba. And my reason for that is I think that it doesn't actually matter that much. It's really just preference. But the um, doing Zabok first means that you're not going to die to some like crazy upset stomach uh, type, you know, rock formation that comes out right when the blood spawns come out. And, you know, maybe there's acid on next to some of the water jugs and it can be hard to get to the right one in time. Like that does happen. Um, Baba, I 
typically don't really struggle with anymore now that I've practiced doing Red X a whole lot. So I'm fine doing Baba last. And Baba is a zero supply boss if done correctly. Also, I really like being salted for the monkey room. I think it helps a lot. I, a lot of people use the argument that, oh, salting affects your range stats more than your melee. So, you know, it's better to be salted for Zabok. But another thing is, you know, when you're doing Zabok last, there's going to be a different um, path level that Zabok is. It's not going to be consistent. And that makes prayer flicking a bit harder since it's not the same timing every time. So again, I it's it's really just a preference thing, but I have more success and am more consistent with doing Zebok first. So we're going to do that. Also, two last very quick tips that I want to mention before we um, get into it are things that you should be aware of that really do help out with the raid. So one is that this uh, when you use the smelling salts, every 15 seconds on the timer, you're going to get your stats boosted back up. Um, by about 26 or 25 points to 125. So what that means is that, you know, if you need to brew, you should try to do it right before that 15 second interval so that you can get your stats restored. Um, and there's actually, since your stats are boosted by 25 or 26, you can actually brew twice before uh, this salt tick happens and your stats get restored. So for example, you know, like if the timer is at 750, when it gets down to like 748, you can click a brew once, and then right when it gets down to 745, you can click it again. And then immediately after, your stats will get boosted back up, which will like kind of undo that double brewing your stats down. And the reason you want to make sure to do this and not just brew whenever is it'll keep your damage up really high. It'll make things go a lot faster. And if you're doing more damage, then the bosses are going to die faster and you're going to have a less chance of dying. So it's always good to try to keep an eye on that salt timer for when you're brewing. Another thing that I want to mention that um, a lot of you probably already know is that if you are brewed above 100 HP, then the bar around your health, it'll like count down. And after uh, that circle goes all the way down, um, it, you'll actually lose an HP and it'll go back down towards 99. You can actually double click your rapid heal prayer if you're overhealed to cancel this effect out. And I use this quite a bit here. Um, not a huge deal, kind of a minor optimization, but it's something I just wanted to call out. All right, and after that very long ass intro, let's finally get into the raid and kick it off. All right, so we're going to start off with the Path of Krondus here, which is the puzzle room before doing Zabok. So the way this puzzle room works is there's a tree in the middle and you need to pick up a water container and then run to the corners of the room to fill it up with water and then use that water on the tree. Every time you do that, it'll restore the tree 100 health and you need to get it up to 200 health before you can move on. So essentially you just need to run to two corners of the room to fill up your water container, run back and then use it on the tree. That said, if you're too slow, crocodiles will come out and start munching on the tree, getting its health down. If that happens, then you're going to have to go to a third corner to get more water. Also, if you get hit by the obstacles while running back after collecting water, then you'll lose half of your water. So if that happens as well, then you won't be able to heal the tree up 100 and you'll need to go back. So um, yeah, essentially you just need to run to two corners, fill up your water container twice, use it on the tree, but if you mess up, get hit, or go too slowly, you'll need to go to a third corner. But you should never mess up on this room. I'm gonna show you how you can do it perfectly every time. So as you enter this room, you wanna make sure you're clicking on the right side of the barrier to pass through. And then immediately after that, spam click the water container to run over there. If you have a full inventory because you're bringing extra supplies, you can drop a prayer potion or something on the way to the water container to make room for it. And then you'll pick it up as soon as you get there. And as soon as you see yourself pick it up, then you wanna click this tile that I have marked here. As soon as you see your true tile indicator get to that tile, then that's when you're gonna click over to the right to run towards the waterfall. So right when your true tile gets there. Then once you get to the waterfall, you're actually going to click on your container and use it on the waterfall instead of just clicking the waterfall. The reason for this is it's actually one tick faster, so it saves 0.6 seconds. Um, it, not a big deal, but you know, again, remember there's a crocodile that comes out if you're too slow, and this makes it a lot easier to not have that happen. Then right after you fill up your water container, then what you're gonna do is run back to the left here 
and uh, you know run to that tile that we have marked and then we're going to click on this other tile we have marked by the tree as soon as you see your true tile indicator get to that tile in the center then that's when you'll click on the tree so you you first click on your water container to use it and then click on the tree right when your true tile gets there immediately after that and you see the water container get used then you'll click over to the top right again similar story you're first going to run up to one of these two tiles at the bottom left here below the first uh, spike that comes out at the, at the top left and then once you're there then you're going to run to the right to the water use your water container on the waterfall as soon as you see the waterfall deplete that's when you click back to the left and then just use your water container on the tree now that's what it looks like in an ideal world but sometimes these green obstacles will come out and block your path for the tiles i have marked and get in the way if you look at the spikes that are coming out of these crocodiles' mouths, that they don't, don't reach to the bottom two rows uh, of this area here, the top ones. So what that means is you can be on either of the bottom two rows as you're running across. You need to make sure that you do start in that column though, where the tile I have marked is, because if you start there, then when you run across, it'll kind of skip the bottom crocodiles with spikes. So you need to start on one of these two tiles here. And which one you start on is just going to depend on the green obstacles that are shooting out. So uh, they actually can't both come on the bottom rows at the same time, the bottom two rows. So you'll just do, you know, whichever row there isn't an obstacle to start out with. So as you see, you know, I have this tile marked here. And so I run to that after picking up the water container. But if I see there's an obstacle coming for that row, then I'll go to the tile below it and then start running there. As you're running, if you see there's a, that there's a green obstacle coming directly for you, what you can do is from wherever your true tile marker is, you can click up one tile and then right two. So you're still moving two tiles to the right um, during that tick, but then you'll move either up or down to dodge the green obstacle. So you can see how I'm doing that. It takes a little bit of practice and good click accuracy, but not too bad. Uh, so that's how you can dodge these green obstacles. Once you fill up your water on the way back, same story, you can just click to whichever row you don't see the obstacle and then run through it. And if there is one in your row that's going to hit you, you can either move up or down by a row and still move two tiles to the left. So it's gonna take a little bit of click accuracy and practice, but it's really not too bad. If you get hit also, it's not really the end of the world. Just go to the third um, corner and fill it up again and then you'll be done with the room. Now on to Zebok. So Zebok is one of the um, interesting bosses here in TOA. You can actually block essentially all damage from Zebok if you play perfectly, but that can be pretty challenging, especially when you're first learning. But we're gonna go over his attacks first and then the strategies on how to beat him. So Zebok has a normal like main auto, auto attack that he'll do throughout the fight and he'll shoot out either a gray rock or a water jug. Whenever he's shooting out the rock, you'll need to pray protect from range. Whenever he shoots out the jug, you'll need to pray protect from magic. The damage is actually calculated when the rock and jug hit you, so you don't need to turn your prayer on until it's about to hit you, and then you can turn it off right after you see it hit you. So, you know, you'll see that the, you'll have the protection prayer overhead your character model. As long as that overhead is there when it makes contact with you, you're safe to um, you know, not take any damage, and then you can click to turn it off right after. So that's it for his main attack. He has a couple special attacks as well. So one, he'll launch some uh, acid and water jugs onto the you know, arena, and then a wave will start flowing across the arena. So it'll actually be three waves in a row, and they'll have small gaps in them that depend on Zabok's level. So you can see with the invocations I've selected, Zabok's going to always be level one, which you can see in the top left right here. But um, if you have a higher invocation or, or higher path level for Zabok, then these gaps between the water waves will be smaller. But with a level of one, there's always going to be three tiles. They're gonna be three wide. So really you just need to make sure you're moving into position to get through you know, the water wave and not have to worry about it. That can be a little challenging sometimes with the acid, but if you, you know, back up enough and, you know, chart out a path, you can see how to get to the gap in the wave without having to step on acid. He has another attack also where he'll launch out some rocks onto the arena here, 
as well as a bunch of water jugs. When this happens, you have to use the water jugs to clear some of the spaces behind the rocks and then stand behind them. And then he'll let out a big roar where he'll damage the entire arena except for the spaces behind the rocks. So it's actually for each rock, there's going to be three safe tiles behind it going backward. So as long as you can get a water jug to clear one of those three tiles behind one of the rocks, then you should be safe to go. And I'll explain how to do that in just a bit. And I, I also want to mention with the special attacks, um, I mentioned he can either throw out the waves or the rocks on the field. He'll actually alternate. So there'll be four throughout the arena. It'll either start with a wave or a rock, and then it'll go to the other one and then back to the first and then it'll finish out. So you, your four specials that Zabok will do might be, you know, wave, rock, wave, rock, or vice versa, rock, wave, rock, wave. Note the tiles I've marked for Zabok. So the ones that are close to Zabok are as close as you can stand to him without getting in melee range. So it is safe to stand on these tiles. And then the tile in the back of the room is as far back as you can stand and still hit him with your Bofa or Tebow and not get dragged forward. So that's really it for the fight uh, mechanics. So I'm going to start off by explaining how the water jugs work and how to clear spaces for the rocks. And then we'll go through an example kill, kind of talking through the whole thing. So when a water jug is launched out, you're able to walk up to it and push or pull it towards you. And you can do this from any side of the water jug or even diagonally. So you can push it diagonally and it'll move until you either shoot it or it hits a rock. Um, if you spam click a water jug right after you push or pull it, then it'll attack it um, a couple ticks later. And so about three after it moves about three tiles, it'll pop it. So if you see that the water jug, um, if you can just move it three tiles in a direction and then pop it, the, uh, if that will clear up some space for the rocks, then that's very easy to do. You just spam click it. If you need it to, um, you know, pop somewhere like later down the line, then what you do is you just click to attack it when it's about two or three tiles before where you want it to blow up. So you can see here it's rolling across the arena and then I click it a bit before it gets to behind the rocks. So the diagonal movement with the jugs can be a little bit tricky because it depends on how you push it into the rock diagonally to, uh, to know like which area it will clear. So I've actually, one of my friends has done some very great art that's super helpful here. So shout out to um, Inferno Only, who has a very interesting Hardcore Iron Man unique account. But um, he made a legend here, so you can see the, the colored squares, the red corresponds to a jug. The blue is the splash zone, or the area that it'll clear, and the black are the rocks. So you can see in these pictures, Zebak will be at the bottom of the screen, and if you push this jug up diagonally, if it hits head on with the rock on the corner, as, as in this picture, then it'll clear out all eight tiles surrounding the rock, and then you can stand on the other side of it. So that's safe. However, if you look at this picture here, if you push the rock and it'll go into this corner on the right, then it's actually going to splash and clear the tiles behind the rock here, which is closer to Zabok, so then you'd be screwed and you couldn't get onto the other side of the rock. But if you push it here onto this top left corner, then you can see that it'll also clear some space for you to move. So this is how pushing them diagonally works. So essentially, when you're pushing a jug diagonally into a rock, you need to make sure it hits the rock head on or on the corner side that is toward the um, safe area that you want to stand on where you want the water to be cleared because if you push it onto this corner that's not on that safe side as in this picture here you're not going to be safe uh, that's really it for the jug mechanics so with the upset stomach invocation there's a lot of acid that's thrown onto the field and the jugs only clear a three by three area so it can be a bit tricky but let me show you where i stand for these upset stomach invocations they box and how it works and i'll have several examples so when the first uh when the first jugs are thrown out you want to be standing at the top left of the arena right here so we're going to just stand up here and wait for the first rocks to get thrown out when they do a lot of the time one jug will spawn pretty much right on you and you can just push it to the right and spam click or push it directly into the rocks and that'll clear it most of the time. 
when that's not the case you can typically you know find one nearby that you can push and maybe you'll need to wait for it to get closer to the rocks like i said and when it's two or three tiles before where you want it to blow up that's when you start spam clicking it so it's really that's all you have to do for the first one then for the second set of rocks which is later on in the fight those are usually back in the arena a little bit more so what i like to do is i like to stand right in front of zabok in the center here and then when those come out typically you can push a rock backwards and shoot it or push it diagonally into the rocks depending on you know where they land sometimes it might look like you need to step on acid on one of the jugs to push it into the right spot but if you look around the arena quickly then you should be able to find a jug where you won't need to step on acid to get it into the rocks uh, that said the second set of rocks you do have a bit less time to clear them and get behind them than the first set so just make sure you know right when you see it come out you're immediately looking for a jug and going there to clear um the safe spots it, it does take a lot of practice but as you can see i'm showing lots of examples of me clearing these and you should be able to do it pretty much 100 percent of the time with enough practice and standing in these two spots that I've shown does help out a lot. One more thing I want to mention that I haven't talked about yet is Zebok's blood spawn attack. So he does have access to blood magic. And it, um, you can see it; these red lines will appear by him right before he does a blood attack. If you are you know, not needing to pray against a projectile right when he does that, you can pray protect from mage to protect his blood attack. But occasionally when he does his blood attack, it'll spawn these little red balls on the arena and they'll chase you around. You need to make sure that you keep moving whenever this happens because they will kill you if they catch up to you and just sit on you. They, they lose health you know, over time as they move around and they die off pretty quickly if you don't get touched. But sometimes these guys will come out right when he throws the rocks. And so when that happens, what I like to do is I like to figure out you know, where I need to run to, what jug, <clears throat> and then I'll make a little bit of a loop or a circle to make the blood spawns follow me and end up where I need to push the jug. You don't actually need to run around that much if you just do like little, you know, side steps and circles like this, then the bloods will miss you and you know, they'll be pretty slow and chase you around. So you just need to make sure you get a little bit of distance between you and them and then push the jug out of the way. They should have died off by the time you actually need to stand behind the rock to be safe. So they're not too bad to deal with, but it can be pretty stressful at first whenever it, um, the blood spawns and you get a jug jugs thrown out at the same time. When Zabok's almost dead, somewhere about 20% health, 20 to 25, he'll speed up his attacks, but he'll stop using his specials. So you'll hear him essentially roar, and then after that, then his attacks will get a bit faster, and you'll need to you know make sure you're responding appropriate appropriately. One other thing I want to mention is the path level of Zabok. You know, it started at path level one. Um, every two path levels, so at two and four, he will speed up his attacks. And so that's why I like doing Zabok first, is because when he's path level one, it's pretty easy to flick your prayers and not use up very much prayer points. When, he, uh, when you're doing a level two or a level four Zabok, it's a lot harder to do it with zero supplies. So just another advantage to doing Zabok first. And again, on the prayer flicking, um, you know, as you see the projectile hit you right after that, that's when you can turn your prayer off. You don't need to flick your prayers perfectly or even close to perfectly to do these solo 400s. I just like to, to conserve supplies whenever possible. And it can be good practice prayer flicking for other content in the game. So, you know, you can um, have your protect from mage prayer up here. And then as you see the jug make contact, it'll make a sound as well that's when you can click to turn it off. Then as you see the next projectile coming in, a bit before it hits you, click to turn your prayer on. After it hits you, you can click again to turn it off. And you can actually do the same thing here with rigor or piety throughout the raid. Um, you know, just you can click to turn rigor on and after you see your attack animation start or if you see the XP drop, then you can immediately click to turn either rigor or piety off after that. Then, you know, a little bit later, before your next attack animation starts, you can click to turn it on again. If you're using a four tick weapon, such as a Bofa, then the timing works. So if you have your drop um, XP drop speed on medium, then right as it's going toward the top of your screen, that's when you'll click to turn rigor back on and then um, off again immediately after your attack animation starts. 
Um, if you're using a T-Bow or a Fang, which is a five tick weapon, it's a little bit later. So after the XP drop goes off the screen, you have to wait a tick or just, you know, wait about half a second and then you can click it. But um, again, don't need to do this perfectly, but it does help a bit. If you're curious here how much my T-Bow helps at Zabok over just having a Bofa, you can see that on the left here with an invocation level of 400 and no BGS damage, the T-Bow is actually only two seconds faster to kill Zabok than the Bofa uh, with my crystal armor. That said, you can BGS Zabok up to 20 damage. If you do more than 20 damage of BGS, it doesn't reduce his defense anymore. But if you get a 20 BGS hit on Zabok, then you can see that the time to kill difference here is 10 seconds with the Tebow over the Bofa. So if you don't have a Tebow, essentially on average, it's gonna take about 10 seconds longer to kill Zabok. But other than that, same fight. All right, now let's look through at an example Zabok kill from start to finish. As I'm returning my water here to the tree, you can see I go ahead and activate my uh, special attack and double flick rapid heal to reset the regeneration on my HP. Then I walk into the room with Zabok and we're gonna get started. Right after getting teleported onto the room, I use a ranging potion, summon a thrall, and then pull up protect from melee and piety and BGS him. I hit over 20 damage, so then I go ahead and equip all my ranging gear. And then now I just get to flicking. If you miss your first BGS, you can step back and then try another one right after he attacks to get in a second hit. But yeah, we're just going to stand here and we wait for the first um, jugs to get thrown out. And you can see this one, I just push it directly north easily into the rock. And then I have a safe spot here to stand on. So typically that, that'll happen if you're standing over in that top left of the room. Um, it's, it's usually a pretty easy solve like that. But then we just sit here and you can see I'm flicking my prayers. Like I said before, what I'm doing is I'm turning my prayer off right when the projectile hits me and then turning it back on when it's, you know, a little bit before it falls onto me. I left protect from mage on there to protect from the blood attack. Now we're going to have the first wave coming from the south and you can see I'm already standing in the gap here. So I'm just going to keep flicking my prayers and resummon my thrall. As for flicking rigor, remember that I turn it off right after I see the XP drop. So um, I'm not doing it perfectly right now because I'm making sure to run away from the wave. But as soon as I see that XP drop come up or the attack animation start, that's when I can turn rigor off. So that's what I'm doing. Here you can see we have a diagonal path where the jug just goes right into the rock there. And that's perfectly safe. So then we can get behind it. So pretty easy solves here. And then again, just kind of back to flicking my prayers. And I do want to reiterate, you don't have to flick your prayers here or even do it even close to perfectly. I recommend trying it for practice uh, just to improve, but I usually finish the raids with plenty of um, prayer potions left over. So if you're not good at flicking, don't worry. Just, you know, do your best. Here, um, I'm standing, you know, in the middle here with looking at the wave coming from the north. Going to move over to the safe spot here. I also want to mention whenever you do get hit by the poison when the waves come out, the first tick or two, it'll do a little bit less damage. So you have a little bit of time to step off the poison as it first comes out. But you can see I accidentally stepped in one of the poison piles there and took about 20 damage, but no big deal. And again, just flicking my prayers and just blocking all the damage from Zabok. You can see that he used his blood attack there. So I turned my protect from mage on for a second, but it was the blood spawns. And so I'm just going to run back and around a little bit just to dodge these guys. They're pretty slow, so it's pretty easy to dodge. And now they're dead. And again, just going to flick my prayers. He just did the roar thing a second ago. So now he's going to start attacking a little bit more quickly. But still just the same idea. And if you, you're struggling with the prayer flicking, what you can do is just keep your overhead on all the time and then just flick rigor on and off while keeping your overhead prayer. And that'll still save you some prayer points, but not as much as if you're doing it the way I am. But yeah, pretty straightforward fight once you get down dealing with the jugs and the waves. And with that, you can see Zebok is now dead.
and we're going to move on to the next room. Next, we're going to move on to the path of Scabarus. So the first uh, thing we have to do here is the puzzle room. So there's four different puzzles to start out that are laid out in a two by two grid. And if you're doing a solo raid, you can actually just do two of the puzzles to advance. So once you do one of the puzzles, it opens the door across the hall from you. So what you can do is you can do one of the puzzles, squeeze through the crack to go across, then go into the next puzzle room, do that, then hop across the gap, and then move on to the final memory puzzle. So out of these four puzzles, there's one of them that I don't like to do, and that's the one with the obelisks here that has, um, you know, you have to shoot them in the correct order and rocks fall on you. This one can take quite a while if you're not lucky with getting the pattern, so I typically skip it. So what I'll do is when I enter this room, I'll, I'll first identify where the obelisks are, and then I'll say, okay, well now I'm gonna take the zigzagging path that avoids that tile. So if it's over here in the top left here, then I'm going to enter the left room first, and then when I cross, I get to do the bottom left and top right puzzles. So that's really it. Um, for if you have the plugin that I recommend you turn on at the beginning, then these puzzles are super easy to complete. So first is this light puzzle. Uh, essentially, the lights you need to step on will be highlighted red. Just make sure that you don't step on the ones that are not highlighted red. And um, in terms of like the timing and the walking, what you can do is as soon as you see your true tile marker move on to one of the places you're trying to walk, that's when you can click to the next place. So you see your true tile marker go over one of the red highlighted tiles, you click to the next one and so on. Then this next puzzle we have is this little memory one. And so once you click on the button, then five different tiles will be lit up in order. If you have the plugin on, they'll be numbered, which helps a lot. And then once you do that, you just have to step on them in order. And again, once your true tile moves onto one of them, you can immediately click to the next one. Also, you wanna make sure that you don't accidentally step on other tiles in between, so you can't run across other tiles. You can see with this layout here, after stepping on number two, I have to run to the side, then to three, and then back down to the side to get to four. But um, as long as you're careful with your clicks and time it to where you're clicking right after you see your true tile marker move, then it's pretty straightforward. The other puzzle that we have is the sum puzzle. And so this one here is going to be, you click the button and then you have to step on a certain number of tiles to add up to a number. Um, and it would be a pain in the ass if you had to memorize the numbers that all of these stand for, but luckily you don't thanks to this TOA plugin. So once you step on it, you just have to walk over all the red tiles. And this one, if the red tiles are in a line, then you're able to just click to the last one and as you run across them, it'll activate all of them. So pretty straightforward. And again, I'm totally ignoring the, uh, the other puzzle with the obelisks that you have to shoot. So that's really it for these uh, first few puzzles, pretty straightforward to get through. And then there's the puzzle in the back of the room. So once you uh, clear past the first four, then you have to do a memory puzzle. And again, super straightforward. You just have to uh, flip over the tiles. I usually like to flip four when I start out on one side so that I know where all of them are and then run across and then just start clicking on them and flipping them back. Um, you know, it, it it's pretty straightforward again, like once your true tile moves to a location, that's when you can click to the next one. And so when your true tile is touching the tile you clicked on or, you know, one of the outside squares, that's when it'll flip over and activate. So pretty straightforward, not too bad. With some practice, you should be able to get through this puzzle room consistently in under a minute, between 50 and seconds to a minute typically. So then we're gonna move on to the fight with Kefri next. Now we're going to go into the Kefri fight, and this is probably the easiest of the bosses within TOA, but there's still a few intricacies that you need to know. So if you remember, we are using the more overlord, overlords um, invocation, and so what that means is we're gonna have to get the mud to be placed in specific spots to trap the ranged overlord. But before we do that, let's talk about the fight in general. So the Kefri fight is pretty straightforward. As you enter the room, Kefri will launch projectiles at you. And since we do have the aerial assault invocation on, they'll get launched and explode in a three x three area. And the shadows will indicate where they're going to explode. Essentially what that means is you just need to move out of the way before it hits. Um, and it's pretty easy to time. I do want to mention that Kefri's level, if you look at the top left, it's either going to be a one or a two here, depending on you know who got leveled up with Walk the Path after killing Zebok. And if Kefri is a two, 
then the fireballs will fall a little bit faster than if Kefri's a one. Um, if you're doing a level four or higher Kefri, they'll fall even faster. But that's okay. You know, even with the two, they're still pretty easy to dodge. You just need to make sure you move out of the way before they hit. So um, it might take a little bit of practice to get the timing down, but the way I typically do it is I'll, I'll hit and then run over two tiles and then hit and then run back and so on. As long as you attack at the same time the fireball explodes, then that means you can get in one more attack before the next fireball hits you. Because Kefri's fireball attack is on a six tick cycle, whereas the Fang is a five tick weapon. Um, what, so the first thing you're going to do when you enter the room is you're going to make your way over to this first black square al along the corner here. And you're going to make sure you're standing here when Kefri blows mud for the first time. So occasionally during the fight, you'll see Kefri stop attacking with fireballs. And when that happens, that means it's going to shoot out a mud line at you. Um, you can see that that happens here and I move over to this corner. As the mud line gets shot out, you want to spam click off to the side somewhere to run out of the way so you don't get crushed by it. One quick tip is if you get blown into a corner on the mud line here, and then you click two tiles down and one to the side from the corner of Kefri, then spam click there. You can run there and then attack Kefri um, as you know sooner than if you just run directly to the right or something. But um, yeah, it's, it's not too bad to dodge the mud. Um, you do want to make sure that you get your first mud shot here. And then the second one, you want to be on that other marked tile for your next mud. Occasionally, Kefri will also launch some eggs throughout the room. And when this happens, you need to just make sure you're not standing next to them when they explode. Um, if you're two tiles away, you won't take damage from them. Unless Kefri is level four or higher, then you need to be three tiles away from the eggs. You can actually break the eggs by attacking them, but that's not really necessary and it loses you some time. So once this happens, you just need to make sure you aren't near the eggs when they blow up. Uh, pretty simple. Once the eggs explode, then some little bugs will come out. And from that point onward, you need to pray protect from range whenever possible, because they will do damage. They don't do very much damage, but it does add up over time throughout the fight. So you just want to have protect from range up. And you can see that I've been flicking piety the whole time, similar to what we were doing with Rigor at Zebok. The Fang is a five tick weapon, so a little bit after the XP drop disappears, that's when I click to turn piety on and then out off after I attack. But um, yeah, so typically the way the fight will go is you get your first um, mud blown by moving to that corner, then the eggs will come out and you dodge them. Then after the eggs, you'll typically not finish Kefri's first phase. Once you get his health down, then what he's going to do is spawn two overlords. So there's going to be a ranged overlord and a melee overlord. You need to make sure you have protect from range on when this comes out, and you want to kill the ranged overlord as quickly as possible. If you use your fang specs, then you can typically kill it before the melee overlord comes around the room and gets to you. That said, if, the, if you're missing and your fang's whiffing and you're not able to kill it, as the melee overlord comes over and gets to you, what you can do is you can shift click to step under the melee while you're waiting for your, the cooldown between your fang attacks, come out and stab the range one, and then shift click back under the melee and do this. Uh, this should be able to prevent you from getting hit really hard by the melee, but again, this is pretty rare in a 400. You should be able to kill the range uh, overlord before the melee gets there. Once the ranged one is dead, then change to protect for melee and start attacking the melee overlord. The way I typically do this is I'll attack him and then I'll control click uh, to walk four tiles. So then I'll wait for my um, you know true tile marker to move four times and then I'll click to attack him again. And I'll keep doing that back around the room because remember I want to make my way over to that second marked tile here to be there whenever the mud is blown. And then soon after, um, you know, you kill the melee Vang or melee um, overlord, and Kefri starts attacking again, he will blow mud for a second time, and so you need to make sure you back up to that tile right there. And then that's going to create a little triangle there that um, to trap the ranged overlord for the end of the next phase. And, you know, once you finish killing off the melee overlord, make sure you put your protect from range back on so that the little flies that are around won't damage you anymore. Then after that, it's just back to what you were doing before with dodging the fireballs. So pretty straightforward. 
once you do finish the second phase, so once you get uh, Kefri's health down again, then you're going to need to run to this other marked tile that I have in the corner here. And what happens when you do that is it's going to drag the ranged overlord in between the two muds that you've blown and he'll get trapped there. So um, you need to make sure you run there immediately when that happens. Also, I want to mention that if you're doing pretty low DPS and you're not going to be able to finish the second phase uh, before more mud is going to be blown, then just stand next to the line that you already blew here and you can just keep creating lines here um, and it shouldn't affect the trapping at all. It should be fine. Also, at the beginning of the fight, you know, if you're doing DPS pretty slowly and you're going to have a second mud blown before the first phase ends, then you just stand in the same corner here and it'll just blow more mud back into that corner. So that's totally fine. But now let's assume that, you know, you got your trap set up and now you finish the second phase. So you run back to this corner here and you immediately put on protect from melee and start attacking the maging overlord. So the way the mage overlord works is that it has um, a special attack that it charges up. So you can see these little red um, bug things below it. Once it builds a full circle of those red things below it, then it'll launch a very powerful mage projectile at you that can deal you know, upwards of 50 or 60 damage. So the way to avoid it is if you attack him successfully three times or for one hit that's 39 damage or more, then it'll cause him to move and fly across the room and reset. So the way, what that means is typically, you know, I'll use the fang because it's very accurate. And so I'll run to the corner and start fanging the um, arcane scarab immediately. Once you hit him three times, then immediately you'll run across the room. And I run along the edge here so that the ranging vanguard or ranging overlord, I don't know why I keep calling them vanguards, the ranging overlord can't hit you. And then you'll, uh, you know, make your way across the edge, praying protect from range to avoid damage from the flies. And then you'll um, start attacking the arcane scarab again. As the melee makes its way over to you, that's when you're going to change to protect from melee to block its damage. Definitely use your fang specs here if your fang misses once, because you want to make sure you hit the arcane scarab three times before it gets its mage attack off. Also, I want to mention, you know, if you do 39 or more damage in one hit, that'll cause him to move immediately. If you make him move a second time from this corner here, he's gonna fly back to the right side uh, of the room, uh, or I guess the south side of the room in the middle here. And so then again, you just run back over there and then start attacking him. As soon as the maging overlord dies, you're gonna you know make sure you have protect from melee on and attack the melee overlord and kill it. Then once you kill it, then you can focus back on Kefri. Also, you know, sometimes you'll be wanting to move somewhere to avoid the um, attacks that are coming at you, you know, that shadow 3x3 three three attack. And sometimes there'll be f like flies or bugs in the way and you might click to move somewhere and accidentally click to attack something else and it'll get you hit. So what you can do is whenever you need to make sure you're moving, hold down shift when you click. And then that'll make sure like even if you click on an enemy, it'll move to walk there or run there instead. So shift clicking can be pretty useful for navigating the room at this part of the fight. Now, once you kill the both the uh, maging and the melee overlords here, then you're going to want to stand on this corner here uh, for Kefri when the next mud is blown. Really now you just need to finish the fight. No more overlords are going to be spawned. So you just kind of hang out um, and make sure you're on this corner when mud is blown because you don't want to block off the safe spots for you to attack Kefri. I've drawn a line here that shows where the ranging overlord's um, attack range is. And so as long as you're outside of this red box, you're safe. But that means we need to stay on this uh, west side of Kefri and keep attacking here. So we don't want mud to clog it up, which is why we're going to go to the corner whenever the mud's blown. So again, you know, you just kind of hang out here and keep doing this. As you finish the third phase and get Kefri's shield down for the last time, mud will be blown immediately after you do your last attack so as you hit your last attack try to run back over to the left to get in that corner again and then you know not block off your safe area to attack then you know once um that's done then you just need to get his health down and then he's dead make sure you keep summoning your thrall whenever it runs out here and stay on top of your prayer potions because you know your prayer will drain 
if you're really sweaty and one tick flick the whole time, then you can do this room without using up any prayer. And at the end, if you have a lot of health left, you can actually turn off your range prayer and just flick piety to save a little bit of prayer too, if you want to. But that's really it for the Kefri fight. It's fairly straightforward. Now let's look at an example of me going through the whole thing. So first, right after we finish Zabok, as I run across here to the Path of Scabrous, I equip all my melee gear, including my Fang. Then we're gonna speed through this puzzle room real quick. And then as I'm finishing up the puzzle room right here, you can see that I go ahead and click my special attack bubble and walk on into the Kefri room. Now I'm going to sip my Divine Ranging Potion, turn on Piety, and attack Kefri, and then summon a Thrall. And then I make my way over to this first corner here, because remember this is where we want the first mud attack to be done. Also note that as soon as the Fireball projectile is at the very peak of its uh, path, that's when it spots you and sees where you're going to be standing, and then you can move. So we got the first mud blown um, in the right spot, so that's good. We're just gonna stay on this side and keep moving back and forth as these fireballs come out. Remember, I click right as it's at its peak in the, um, you know, in, the, in its trajectory. That's when I can move over, and I'm just flicking piety here, and we knocked Kefri down. So then I moved to this corner here. Um, got to run out of the way from that guy attacking. So then if I stay up here and attack. Then once he comes and flies at me, I can move down two tiles and keep attacking. And I didn't quite kill him. I'm going to shift under here. Okay, and luckily he died. So that was getting a little scary with the melee coming under me. Um, but you can see I shifted under him, so I was safe. Now what I'm doing is I'm attacking the melee, and as soon as I attack him, then I control click away and walk for four tiles, then attack the melee again. So pretty straightforward. Now we're just attacking Kefri, and I made my way back over to this side, so as soon as he stops attacking and is going to blow mud, I can move to that tile that I have marked. So again, we're just moving back and forth here. And now he's stopped attacking, so I move back here. And then I get knocked, and then I spam click to the left so I don't get trapped in between the mud. And then now I'm just going to continue the fight as normal. Here, if your spec energy is getting close to 100, it's not in this case for me since I use two specs on the uh, Ranging Overlord, but if it is, you can go ahead and use a spec here. And just make sure your Thrall is out. It will often run out around here. So Kefri drops some more eggs, but that's okay. We're just going to ignore him. All right, now he's down to zero, so I'm going to run to this corner, and that's going to trap the Ranger. I missed my first attack on this arcane, so I summon my, or I use my spec, and you can see I hit a 41 there, so I hit 39 or more, so that mean, made him move immediately. So I just ran out along the edge here and start attacking him again, change my prayer to melee as the melee gets close to me, and fortunately now the arcane one is dead, and then we can focus on the melee. So just moving out of the way whenever I see the projectile coming at me, and just flicking piety. Now that the melee is dead, I'm putting my protect from range back on. And remember, we want to be standing in the corner here whenever the mud is blown, because uh, we want to make sure that we're not blocking off our squares that are safe from the ranger that's over on the east side of the room. So we're just moving back and forth. He's going to blow mud, so I'm standing in this corner. And then I spam click two tiles down and one to the side, so I can just run straight up there. Again, still just flicking piety. And this is the part where you'll dump your specs into them. If you have any spec energy left, just dump things specs. A lot of people say you could use BGS here on Kefri, but I don't think it's that good, just because Kefri's defense is pretty low anyway. The Fang almost always hits. So as I get my hit here, I'm standing in the corner, and that makes more mud over here. And the reason for that is so I'm not blocking off the safe tiles again. And now I'm just moving back and forth. I can see I'm almost out of prayer here, but still have a lot of HP, so I actually turn off my protect from range just to save on prayer. I want to make sure I have enough prayer to get through the rest of the fight. I'm getting hit, you know, you, you can see some fives here from the flies, but nothing too big. And that's really it for Kefri. Kefri's dead, I'm going to equip all my mage gear as I make it up here and leave the room. After finishing Kefri, then you're going to make your way over to this helpful spirit here in the middle of the room and claim from the helpful spirit. 
So you're going to absolutely want one of these um, smelling salts from the helpful spirit. And so typically what that means is you're going to pick the chaos selection in the middle because that'll often have a salt and then a lot of brews and restores as well. However, you could see sometimes it won't have any salt here. You, you have, um, and in that case, you have to select power. Um, so select chaos if it has a salt. If not, then you have to pick power because salting yourself is extremely important. That said, you know, if you're picking power, you don't get any brews and restores here. You just get the salt and some uh, liquid adrenaline. In that case, the rest of the raid can be a bit challenging, particularly Akka. And you have to get through Akka with the brews that you have in your inventory. If you don't have a lot of experience, I would recommend maybe bringing a second or even third brew. And then that gives you a little bit more padding against Akka and you don't have to butterfly. Because honestly, I don't re recommend butterflying Akka in general in a, a 400 if you only have a trident as your mage weapon. Because the Fang and the Bofa will do a lot more damage per second than the tri uh, than the Trident, so Butterflying's not the best approach. But anyway, with that, let's go ahead and move on to the Path of Het and start talking about Akka. After claiming my supplies from the Helpful Spirit, as I make my way to the next uh, room, I'll typically take out the Salt and then arrange my pack resource pack so that the second thing in it is a Restore. Um, as I withdraw things for Akka, I want to take out a brew first and then a restore and then brews after that. So now on to the mining puzzle. So this puzzle is actually pretty straightforward. Um, I will note that you do want to have at least 85 mining and a dragon pickaxe if you want to be able to get through the puzzle in one cycle consistently. But, um, you know, if you're not trying to rush and not trying to necessarily make the 40 minute time, you don't need 85 mining and a dragon pickaxe. They just help a lot. So the way this puzzle works is there's some mirrors throughout the room and there is a beam of light shooting out from the statue on the left. You have to use the mirrors to direct the light to the statue on the right and then you can mine the obelisk in the middle. So that's really it. Um, if you have the plugin on that I recommended you have on, then it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, it tells you where to place the mirrors. So as you come in this room, first you want to pick up your pickaxe from the statue. You can store a pickaxe in here, so I recommend doing that, and then enter the room. Typically the mirrors that are on the outside edges of the rooms are the ones you can pick up. So grab in one of those mirrors and then place it on the marked tiles from the plugin and just rotate it to direct the beam path to the second statue, as I said. Um, you can see that I have some tiles marked a little bit outside of the obelisk. And the, the reason is, you know, as the light beam shoots out, if you move toward the obelisk and start mining it at the same time, you can get an extra mine in, and then that let, allows you to mine the uh, obelisk's HP down in one cycle. So the way this works is you'll stand at least one tile away from the obelisk, and then when you see that clock um, thing on the first statue fill up all the way to green, and so when it's fully green, that's when you want to click the obelisk to start mining. And if you're already standing up on the obelisk when you do that, it won't work. You have to be at least one tile away. That said, uh, occasionally, you know, you can uh, be two tiles away. Sometimes with some of the light puzzles, the beam path will actually be where you want to stand one tile away. So in that case, you can stand two tiles away. And then when you see that clock fill up all the way and get to green with that timer, then if you click, you'll run two tiles. You won't get hit by the light and you're still able to mine it successfully. So that's really it for the light puzzle, pretty straightforward. Now we're going to move on to probably the hardest fight in the raid, which is Akka. One last thing, as you finish up the mining puzzle here, go ahead and deposit your pickaxe back at one of the statues before moving into the Akka room. Alright, so for Akka, you want to make sure you use your smelling salts before you start the fight, because that'll boost your stats up. And then you want to, you know, just run in the room and get it started. But before that, we're going to talk about the fight in general and some of Akka's mechanics. So Akka has three different attack styles that he'll rotate through. So he'll be praying uh, protection prayers against two attack styles and vulnerable to the third. And depending on what he's praying, you'll know what he's going to attack with. So initially, if he's praying against both melee and ranged, then you have to attack him with magic and you know he's going to hit you with melee. If he switches his prayers to ranged and magic, then you have to attack him with melee and you know he's going to attack with ranged. 
And then finally, if he switches his prayers to ma magic and melee, then you attack with ranged and you know he's going to attack with magic. So really, you just have to memorize this. It, he always changes in this cycle. So starting where you have to attack him with magic, then you attack him with melee, then you attack him with range, and he rotates through that cycle over and over again. And also for his attacks, he starts out attacking you with melee, um, then ranged, then magic. So you just kind of have to get that in your head and just, um, you know, kind of rotate through. Typically, he'll only change uh, attack styles when he uses a special attack, but since we're using the Stay Vigilant invocation, that means that either whenever he uses one of his specials, or just any time he attacks, he can change his protection prayers. So you have to be ready to switch your prayer whenever you see that um, happen. I do want to call out that when he changes his attack style, if he's in the middle of, of starting an attack, don't swap your prayer too early because the damage is actually calculated when the projectile leaves Akka. So if he's on uh, the prayers where he's currently using his ranging attacks, and then he attacks and switches to uh, now he's going to use magic attacks, if you click protect for magic before the projectile leaves him, you're going to get hit very hard. So don't switch too quickly there. Also note that there is a sound cue whenever Akka changes styles, you can hear it right here. Whenever you hear that, that's when you know you're going to need to switch your gear and protection prayers. Sometimes with all the other attacks going on, you might not hear it, so don't rely solely on the sound cue, but it's just something to help your brain out to say, hey, like when you see the protection prayer change or the hear the sound cue, that's when you need to change. Um, okay, so as for the Akka fight, he also has a trigger that, um, you know, when you get his health down about 20% in 20% chunks, he'll immediately become invulnerable and summon statues along the corners of the room. The way this works is you need to kill one of the statues, and then once you've killed that statue, when Akka is in that quadrant of the arena, then you can damage him again. So you can see here he turned white and went invulnerable, so I started attacking the statue. Typically, I'll switch to my ranging gear and attack with my Bofa on the statue. If you bring your blowpipe, that works great too but um, the, the, that can kill the statues very quickly. And once they're dead, then you can go back to attacking Akka. Um, Akka does have a timer on the statue, so you can see that there's actually a yellow bar to the left of the statue pictured here, and it's slowly filling up. Once that fills up, all four of the statues will do a powerful bomb attack, and it will damage you pretty uh, severely. So you can think of that as kind of a DPS check. If your DPS on the statue is too low, then it'll do a bomb attack on you. However, you can avoid it. So if you see my marked tiles here, there's kind of this diagonal line towards the edge of Akka's arena. So if you're standing on one side of the line, of the diagonal line, as you can see here, once that uh, yellow meter fills up, the statues will start to move. When you see the statue's spear glow blue, immediately click onto the other side of that diagonal line and then you'll actually dodge the bomb attack so the dps check really isn't an issue you just you just need to make sure you stay aware for, of it have your camera oriented so when you're attacking the statues you can see that yellow bar filling up and know that when it fills up when the statue's spear turns blue that's when you click to move across the uh, diagonal line so that's really it for the dps check um you know you just make sure you're keeping an eye on that because that can kill you very easily. And as you're killing these statues, you always have to remember about praying correctly against Akka as well. So once you've killed the statue, as I said, you can go back to attacking Akka. Once you kill a statue and then fight Akka in that quadrant, next time Akka activates the statues again, you actually have to kill a different statue. So you'll need to move to another quadrant. Um, so you can't just camp in one quadrant the whole fight. So Akka has two other special attacks. Uh, one is that he will turn your character model black, and then as you run around the room, you will release balls, and those will damage you very severely if you retrace your steps and step on them. Uh, this is pretty scary, but essentially when this happens, if you always move two tiles at a time and don't retrace your steps, then you'll never get hit by the balls. So when you are only moving one tile, or if you run to move three, then you're, you'll run two and then one, you can get hit. But um, the way the balls work is whenever you run, it'll create a ball where you were standing before. 
and then the tile in front of you after you move. So if you're always moving two, you'll skip over those tiles in front of you. Um, that said, you know, I would recommend just standing still when possible when this happens. Um, it's really not a huge deal. Just, you know, don't move for a little bit when you, your character model turns black. Unless you need to to, like, get to the next statue or something, then you can run two tiles at a time. Uh, the last special that Akka has is the Memory Blast. So this is very important that whenever you enter the room for Akka, you need to look in the top left corner to see what level Akka is. If Akka is below level two, there will be four memory blasts. If Akka is between levels two and three, or level two or three, there will be five memory blasts. And if Akka is level four or higher, then there will be six memory blasts. So you need to make sure you remember this um, because knowing how many memory blasts can make the difference between dodging them all and getting hit really hard. So Akka will disappear and then these tiles in the middle will start to glow. You have to memorize the pattern and the way I like to do this is I like to just say them out loud in my head as they're going. So I, I just that helps me remember, um, you know, as I see it start here, like I'm telling myself, OK, Akka teleported white, yellow, black, yellow, black. And so I'm telling myself that. And so I know yellow, black, yellow, black. And so you just have to move back and forth through the blasts. Um, it, as long as you memorize it, it's not too bad. You just need to make sure you click to the next quadrant right after you see the blast animation happening. Um, depending on where you are in the fight, you know, you might be able to keep attacking the statues while moving between these blasts if you equip your ranging gear. And that can be kind of nice to speed up the fight a little bit. That's really it for Akko's mechanics. Um, I, you can see I do have a ton of tiles marked here along the floor, and most of those you don't need to pay attention to unless you're butterflying, but you can see in each quadrant there's a tile marked 1, 2, and 3. So this, these actually correspond to the order of where you want to do your attacks if you're trying to do butterfly with a trident or a sanguinesti staff. So shadow is a bit different because it's a 5 tick weapon, so I'm only talking about the trident and uh, sanguinesti staff, but... Um, you just attack on each of these tiles and then move to the next one along like the highlighted path. So you can see here in this example, I didn't get to choose power. Um, I had to choose power when I was selecting from the helpful spirit. So I have only one brew for the entire Aka fight. So I'm actually running around with my trident, hitting him on each of these tiles and then, uh, you know, making sure I don't get hit. If you're doing this with the trident, again, I, I don't recommend doing it unless you have to because you don't have enough brews. Um, once Akka summons the statues, if you want, you can swap to your Bofa and ranging gear to hit the statues since it will likely do more damage than your trident. But um, yeah, that's really it for the Akka fight. Once we get to the end, though, there's one more phase in the Akka fight. So once Akka's HP is completely drained, he'll heal up a little bit to, I guess, about you know, maybe 20%, and then he'll disappear. And then you'll see him go to one of the corners of the room. Now he'll only be vulnerable to melee attacks, and you'll have to run up to him and attack him while dodging all these little white balls. Uh, it's uh, People often call this the cum phase of Akka, because I'll let you use your imagination there. But um, you just need to move to Akka slowly and start attacking him. And then after you do a bit of damage, he'll teleport to a different area of the room. So you'll need to move to that section and so on. This can be pretty intimidating. I died a lot on this phase when I was first learning Akka, but it really the way I like to deal with it now is I like to orient my camera so that some of the balls are just moving horizontally and some vertically like this. And then you can, it's pretty easy to see when a ball is coming at you from the vertical or horizontal. And so you just have to keep your eye on any ball that's moving diagonally. And then if you see one moving towards you that's going to hit you, then you just need to move out of the way. The hitboxes for the balls are slightly in front of them. So once a ball like kind of gets to a tile that you want to walk on, you can step on it as soon as the ball is actually on that tile. But um, again, this is just going to be some practice. You can definitely try out some lower invocation raids first to just get this down. I bring my dragon claws here and I like to use claw specs as well to just speed this phase up a little bit, but it, it's definitely challenging at first. So if you die here um, early on, don't get too discouraged. 
all right so that's it for the aqua fight now um i i'm, I'm gonna show you an example of kind of an entire aqua fight and just talk through through my thought process and what i'm doing the whole time just so you can see it in action all right so i used my smelling salt and i put on augury and protect from uh melee and i summon my thrall you always start off maging aqua i'm just flicking augury here to save a little bit of prayer um, that said, it does make me take a little more damage sometimes, because if he attacks and my augury is turned off, my defense is a bit lower. But that's fine. I'm just kind of flicking it here, trying to do some damage. All right, he changed his prayer, so I immediately change my protection prayer and then swap all my gear and then put piety on. I use a couple fang specs here too, just to like, since my spec energy is full, um, just to like, you know, get it down because it's going to recharge by the end of the fight. All right, now he summoned his statues and used his black ball attack. So I, I equip my ranging gear because Bofa is very good on these statues. And I'm just sitting here and I remember I have my eye on that yellow bar on the left waiting to see if it fills up. And I'm just flicking rigor here to kill the statue. All right, he uses his memory special. So I run to the middle and I'm saying to myself, black, yellow, black, yellow, black. Okay, that's easy enough. I'm just going to go back and forth. All right, so that's all five. Then I'm equipping my maging gear again, because he's praying. Uh, okay, well, he switched his prayers, so now I'm going to equip my melee gear. And we're just going to sit here and flick piety. So you can summon a thrall every time he changes his attack style here, but that'll burn through a lot of prayer points. So if you don't have a ton of restores, it might not be recommended. He changed styles here again, so you can see I waited for a second there before changing to protect from ma magic, but then I swapped all my gear. So we're just going to sit here. He used the black special on me, but I'm not moving, so no balls are coming out. Just kind of hanging out and flicking rigor. But I, I wouldn't recommend changing a, uh, using a thrall every time he changes. That said, I do typically use thralls when he goes into his meleeing style, and he's weak to magic. Or when I'm attacking the statues, I'll use a thrall. So like here, um, I probably could summon a thrall. I guess I don't have to, but I'm making my way back to the middle. I'm memorizing the memory blast while attacking the statue in between blasts. And now I'm just going to go back to this corner and then get ready to walk through the diagonal line if I need to. But the yellow bar is still, you know, filling up pretty slowly and the statue's almost dead, so I'm good there. All right, now I'm equipping my melee gear since he's using his range prayer. Okay, well, now he switched, so I changed to protect from magic and then put all my ranging gear back on. And we're just going to keep attacking him. As you can see, you know, there's a lot of quick swaps that you need to do, so you really need to memorize the order. Like, whatever Akka's praying, you need to know what he's going to attack with and what gear you have to have on. So we're just hanging out here again, not moving, so that that black ball special doesn't hurt me. And just flicking rigor here all right he switched so now i'm going to switch to protect from melee put all my maging gear on and start attacking him again all right he went to the statue so i'm going to equip my bofa again and he's doing the memory blast so i'm making my way to the middle t saying to myself black yellow white red white and just moving between them while attacking the statue in between blasts putting my protect from melee back on because akka is going to come melee me and again, just flicking rigor and have my camera oriented so I can see the yellow bar filling up. All right, the statue's dead, so I need to put on my maging gear since Akka's protecting from the other two styles. Just withdrawing a couple supplies out of my pack there. All right, now I'm switching to protect from range and putting my melee gear on. You can see here I move. I want to make my way towards that other statue, so I moved two tiles one time, and that wasn't a problem with the balls that came out. Remember, whenever the balls are coming out, as long as you move two tiles and don't retrace your steps, you will not take damage from them. So still just flicking piety here. I want to save my spec energy to dragon claw spec at the end. He summoned the statues for the fourth time. So here I'm putting on my bofa, running back to the middle of the room and memorizing the memory blast. You want to really make sure you're keeping an eye on the memory blast whenever it happens and don't try to do too much and like you know miss whatever um order the blasts are going to be in all right so he changed to his um uh, maging style so i'm switched to protect from magic and still just keeping my eye on the yellow bar killing the statue hopefully it'll die in just another hit or two and that should do it and then now back on aka 
Remember, I've been brewing up this whole time whenever possible, and I'm always trying to brew right before that um, smelling salt gets to a multiple of 15. So you can see it's about to be down to three minutes here, so I'm going to go ahead and click my brew. And then my stats will get restored at three minutes, so that I'm not brewing down my stats and I'm able to keep my DPS up. You always want to keep your health really high in the Aka room whenever possible, just because you want to make it so that a mistake doesn't totally knock you out. Alright, so just got to get through this memory blast, and then we should be able to kill him. So again, I was saying the order to myself um, that the blasts were going to be in, so I wouldn't mess up. And then we have 100 HP left to do. I'm going to use a brew here, because right before the 230 mark. Because I want my health to be over brewed a little bit here. For the um, upcoming come phase, as some people like to call it. And just a couple more hits now, and then we should be able to change to our melee gear and finish off Akka. Alright, four health. And there we go. Okay, so now I'm going to equip all my melee gear, including my dragon claws, and protect from uh, mage and piety. And then I claw spec, he moves, so I'm moving down here. I get hit because I'm bad at the game. Claw spec again. Then I equip my fang because now I'm out of attack, uh, special attacks. So... Here now, remember what I said that the uh, hitboxes for the balls are slightly in front of them. So as a ball, you know, is going to be somewhere, I can click on that tile like after the ball has been in that area. But luckily, it's, it's been pretty easy to dodge these so far. I mess up there and get hit once, which is no big deal. You can always just brew up more if you're ever messing up. So just always have your brews out of your supply pack if possible. And again, I oriented my camera so it's really easy to see those horizontal and vertical balls. And that's really it for the Aka fight. Um, definitely the hardest fight in here, but it, it's doable with enough practice. Alright, so we're going to move on now to the path of, I don't know however the hell to say it, Am, Am, Ap Mechan. And we're going to, you know, fight Baba and do the monkey room. As Akka dies here, I make sure to equip um, all my ranging gear as well as my trident. First I equip my maging gear here as you can see just to like get my maging gear at the bottom of my inventory when I equip my ranging here. So just a little inventory management as I run over. I also go ahead and um, if I'm still salted, if the salt hasn't worn off, then I sip a, a brew dose as well as I run over. I always try to have three inventory slots as I enter the monkey room and I pick up the hammer and the vial of liquid that you need to use. So the way the monkey room works is that waves of monkeys will come out and fight you and the monkeys are in a predetermined order it's just the spawn locations are random there's six spawn locations where the holes in the wall are um, and they'll come out at random for each wave so there's two things that can happen while you're going through the monkey room so either the pillars themselves or the vents in the floor will get a red skull in front of them whenever that happens you have about maybe 10 seconds to react and either fix the pillars with your hammer or pour some of the liquid that you picked up one of the vials on the uh, vents if you don't do that you'll take massive damage upwards of 50 so i highly recommend you know prioritizing this like i said you have about 10 seconds or so so you don't need to do it immediately but absolutely do not forget when you see those red skulls come up you need to go you know make sure you're going to get that taken care of as soon as you can so other than that, the monkey room's pretty straightforward. You just want to like kill everything to advance. I think the plugin that uh, I recommended you get actually does have an option for showing the monkey room waves. I've memorized them from doing a lot of TOA, so I don't like having that clutter on my screen. But um, you know, if you're just learning, it definitely can be helpful. So there's a few types of monkeys, um, but be before I get into killing the monkeys, I do want to mention, I always just keep my ranging gear equipped, so my full crystal and everything, and then just swap my weapon. So if I'm uh, ranging monkeys, I'll use my bofa, if I'm maging them, I'll just equip my trident, but keep the rest of my gear equipped, and then if I'm meleeing, I'll equip my fang and my defender, but still just keep all my ranging gear equipped. That makes the swaps way easier, since you're going to be doing a lot of swapping. And most of the room is ranged, so that's why I like to go with my ranging gear. Um, so there's a few types of monkeys I do want to call out. There's the cursed baboons that walk around and they spread venom on the floor. And so if you walk over their venom path, you will get venomed. This is why I bring the Sanfu serum. So it's really just in case. 
if I walk over the venom, then I drink two doses of Samphu Serum to cure it. Uh, you could also bring like an anti-venom with you or something if you don't want to waste your Samphu Serums, but in general, you shouldn't have to use it. Just don't walk over the paths. Uh, part of the time where it's easiest for that to happen is if you attack one of those cursed baboons as they're running around the room, and then they walk around this statue in the center, and so you lose line of sight and chase them, and then you end up running into their venom path. So try to avoid that when possible. Typically, I'll just not attack them when I see them near the pillar, like far away from me. I'll just make sure that I'm killing what I'll, whatever I can first. And then uh, moving on. And uh, the other types of monkeys I want to call out are there's the volatile monkeys. So these are the light brown colored ones that have like a dark brown area around their head. And as they get close to you, they will explode. And the good thing is they can blow up the other monkeys. So the way I deal with these typically is I just wait for them to walk right next to me. And then after they walk right next to me, I click one tile away from them so that I'm out of the blast range. They only blow up in a um, three by three square centered on their model. So essentially just one tile away from where they are. Um, when I'm walking away from them though, I like to make sure that I shift click so that if there is a monkey in the area I want to walk to, I'll actually still walk away instead of attacking that monkey. Um, the last kind of monkey I want to call out are these ones that I have tagged here. And these are the um, monkey shamans. And so these guys actually summon little thralls, so they summon these little blue monkeys to come at you. And so you want to kill them as soon as you can. They have a lot of health, um, so you know they, they can take a little bit, but I typically try to range them as soon as I can if there's no other threats to me. You do want to prioritize not taking damage when you're in the monkey room, because you know your salt from Akka will run out during this room. And if you brew your stats down, then you'll lose your salt boost. But but if you don't brew your stats down at all, then you'll keep that boost from your salt even after it's run out, and then it's very helpful for Baba. The Baba fight itself is actually zero supplies, so you're able to keep that salt boost, um, which is why I like to do Baba last. But um, let's go ahead and get through the monkey room, and I want to um, kind of just talk through my order of how I do things and what I pray just so you can get it down. Like I said, you can use the plugin helper to memorize the order, but I would recommend memorizing what to pray in the order because it'll make it much easier. In general, once you get comfortable in the monkey room, you should never die here and it should essentially, you should never take very much damage at all. Um, you should never have to brew down your salt boost. Um, so yeah, that, that's about it. So we're gonna go ahead and start off this monkey room. Um, I like to organize my inventory like this so I can easily equip my bow or my fang. But I start with my trident equipped, summon a thrall, and then first wave is two of the meleeers, and you just mage them to kill them. Then I'll put on my fang and protect from range. And this wave there's going to be one ranger and one ma major. I equip my bofa to attack the major, then go back to my fang and protect from range to kill the ranger. And then now I know that there's going to be a, a shaman, so I just put protect from melee on and kill the shaman first. After the shaman dies, there's going to be two rangers that spawn. So I'm just tridenting the, these melees and getting ready to switch to protect from range. And then I kill both of these rangers. And then I need to switch to protect from magic and pull my bofa back out. So you can see I'm doing that here. And now there's two majors that come out. I kill both of the majors. And then I also kill this cursed baboon, just because he's close by. And then, well, I didn't actually kill him. Then I switch back to protect from range. Two rangers come out on this next wave. Again, I'm very careful to not step on the venom trails here from the cursed baboon. One tip I want to mention is the cursed baboons are not able to walk over the vents. So if you just stand on one of the vents, then you should be totally safe. After killing those rangers, I go back to protect from mage and kill the two baboon mages here. So there's going to be two mages. Um, I've only killed one of them. There's still one shooting at me. I like to walk by the shamans to lure the volatile monkeys into them so they explode and blow them up. But now that I've killed that major, now I go back to protect from melee. And I'm just going to kill some of these cursed baboons and the shaman. My thrall ran out here. So if I have plenty of, uh, you know, plenty of restores, I can summon another one. But you don't have to. All right, on this next wave, there's going to be one ranger. I don't switch my prayer though to protect from range. I just kill it because there's a lot of meleeers around me. And then after you kill them, then you focus on the shamans and the cursed baboons. 
then the last wave is going to come up once I kill one or two of these guys. And so the last wave is going to have a lot of volatile monkeys as well as shamans. And so you want to try to use the volatile monkeys to blow up as much as you can. All right, so we have a bunch of volatile monkeys coming for me. I'm going to shoot this shaman and then I'm just going to wait for them to come up on me and then move one tile away like that. So he blew up some of those meleeers and now he's blowing up a lot of the thralls. And so this actually speeds up your monkey room a ton if you do that. Um, they really just decimated a ton of the little monkeys following me. So now I'm going to deal with this last cursed baboon and then we're good to go. So that's really it for the monkey room. It's, it's pretty straightforward. After you finish it, equip all your melee gear and then get your bofa and crystal armor at the top of your inventory and get a couple potions out uh, ready to drop them for Baba. So next I want to talk about Baba and the Red X method. So I learned the Red X method from these two guides that I've linked in the description. So shout out to Nick Ince as well as uh, Molgoat Kirby. They definitely helped me learn the Red X method. But I've slightly changed their methods to take my get my own take on them. And I actually have it now to where it's very, very easy. I don't have to worry about dodging the falling rocks because uh, that can be one of the more challenging parts. So I recommend watching those Red X tutorials just to get a feel for what Red Xing is and how it works. But essentially, when you walk under Baba, if your last click was a Red X click instead of a Yellow X, so essentially you're trying to do an action, then Baba will not move, and then so she's unable to melee you. So if you just step under her and then step back out and attack, wait for her to do her Shadow Blast, then step back under her again, you can just do this repeatedly and take no damage. Uh, it is going to take a lot of practice. I do recommend going into a low level raid first um, just and just doing Baba first. Just immediately clear the monkey room and then just keep dying over and over again on Baba until you get the Red X method down. But uh, yeah, when, when, once you do get it down, it's pretty easy to do and it is just totally free points. So again, um, I, I do have the tile markers imported from uh, Nick Entz's video, the Red X video, so I've also linked those in the description. But I'll talk through my take on the Red X method and what I'm doing. So the first thing I do when I uh, have all my melee gear equipped and I enter the room, I run to the bottom left corner and drop a potion. Then I immediately step one tile to the right of it. I turn off my run and activate my special attack energy. Then I summon a Thrall, and then I uh, um, protect from melee as well as piety. So that's a lot to do, but if you're pretty comfortable with your hotkeys, you should be able to do it before Baba gets to you. Right when Baba attacks you, right when you see her start her attack animation, you click to attack her. And then right after your attack starts, so right after you start doing your attack, then you click to the left to walk to where the potion you dropped is. After your true tile moves to the left, before you pick up the potion, then you're going to click on this red um, obelisk thing to the right to start walking to the right with a red X action. You'll walk for three tiles, so you wait for your true tiled marker to move three times. So there's one, two, three. Then right after the third time your true tile marker moves, then you click on the potion again to get another red X action moving back to the left. Then once this, um, once you've done this and you've moved your true tile marker to the left, then you can click to attack Baba. Then right when you see Baba start the animation for her shadow attack by swiping her claw, that's when you click the red obelisk to move back under her. And then after that, then you just walk in two tiles. You walk for your true tile in two tiles. Then you click to attack Baba, walk back out, after she starts her swipe animation, you click the red obelisk. Then after you walk two tiles under her, click to attack her to walk back out. She starts her swipe animation, you click the red obelisk again, and it's just back and forth from that. So you're going to be walking in two tiles every time after you click the red obelisk. As soon as you walk two tiles in, then that's when you click Baba to attack and just repeat that. So you can actually click the red um, obelisk to walk under Baba either right after she starts her shadow attack animation with the swipe or one tick after that. However, if you walk under her right as she starts her swiping animation, then that means that you're not going to get hit by the falling rocks. 
because the falling rock will always come out and be at, a, at the location where you're not going to be if you're walking under and clicking to walk under right as you see her begin her swipe animation so one thing i do want to note for this to work you have to be at least on a level two baba so if you notice at the top left this is a level two baba fight um that's why the invocations that i pick the path invocations as well as doing baba last make it so that baba will always be level two or higher so then you don't have to worry about the falling rocks um for after you uh, are doing you know the first part of the fight one thing you want to make sure you're keeping an eye on is baba's health so as baba's health gets down just below two thirds she's going to jump to the top of the room you can see there are some hit splats on the rocks that she's dropped on the floor as soon as this happens if you don't click to the left to walk off then you'll keep walking to the right and get knocked in the hole and die so i recommend keeping an eye on baba's health and when it gets down to 66 percent that's when you need to click off to the left um I, that said you know like there is a plugin that keeps track of the health for you i think it's like uh npc percentile um health health percentile or something like that i like doing a little bit of mental math so i don't typically use it but um it's no big deal so as soon as baba jumps away um so you see her damage those rocks that had uh, been on the ground and knocks me back and jumps away what you want to do is you want to immediately equip your crystal body and legs as well as your bofa and turn your run back on uh, the reason you equip your crystal body and legs is just to make sure that you can one shot the boulders so i equip all those and then spam click the boulder that you see and make sure you're running to the middle of it then attack the next one when it comes out and if your pathing is perfect and you don't lose any ticks while running up then you should be able to get there only killing two boulders your goal is to get up to the row of tiles that aligns with the bottom side of baba here and it's also the row where i have the tiles that are marked with the number one and you know doing that with only killing two boulders can be pretty challenging it, once you do enough practice you can do it semi-consistently depending on where the boulders are but not always um sometimes the boulders will be two apart from each other so you might get a boulder in the middle and then one on the far right and then the far left when that happens, typically you just want to make sure you shoot it, then run through the gap, and then hope that the next boulder is adjacent to the one that you just broke. Uh, what you can do to make sure you can get up is you, if you stand on this second tile in the uh, middle of the room that I have marked, so the higher up one, you want to be standing in that row when a boulder comes out. If you shoot it immediately, then start moving afterwards, then you should be able to make it up to Baba with plenty of time. So if you aren't comfortable rushing and only killing two rocks, what you could do is wait on that second uh, higher row with the marked tile in the center, shoot a boulder right when they come out, and if you're tick perfect on that, start running immediately, and you can run up to where Baba is. Also, after shooting the boulder, I will often hold down shift while clicking to run up, just to make sure I don't accidentally click on any other boulders, because that'll make me stop and attack instead of continue to run upwards. Uh, this part is pretty challenging with a bofa instead of having a blowpipe since the bofa attacks slower but you know with enough practice you should be able to get very consistent at getting up through these boulders and again this is why i recommend turning down the invocations first starting off with baba and practicing on a low invocation raid without any of the um death limiting invocations turned on and then you can just go in and keep suiciding and practicing until you get it down as you run up after you make it safely past the boulders what you do is you'll drop another potion on this tile that i have marked x and this actually works on either side of the room i just like to use the left side always so you'll drop a potion on that x tile there and then run back to the one then what you want to do is as soon as you melee baba she's going to stop throwing boulders so after she throws a boulder once you hear the sound of the boulder falling stop that's when you can click to it melee baba so you click to melee her and immediately then once you see the attack animation start you can click the sarcophagus next to the three um the guide that we saw before from nick ends he actually clicks the two and then the three i don't like that because clicking the two will allow you to get hit by a rock if you're slightly too early if you just click the sarcophagus first then you don't have a risk of clicking the boulder because you're not even clicking the tile the boulder's on you're clicking the sarcophagus and then your character will immediately run to three once you get to three then you click four and then five once your true tile marker gets to each of those 
um, during this whole time, you need to be holding control. So remember, you have to turn your run off once you get to one. So you drop the potion, walk to tile number one, turn your run off, then hold down control, click the sarcophagus after attacking, then click four and then five, and then let go of control and start holding shift down. And then you um, shift click on the potion. And then as soon as your true tile moves onto the potion there, you click to attack Baba. So this is a bit tricky, but let's go through it one more time in slow motion, just so I can fully explain everything. So once you get past the rocks and make it to the one and you're safe, you run over here and drop a potion on the X. Then you run over to this one tile and you turn your run off. After you hear the boulder sound completely stop after Baba throws one of her boulders, then you can click to attack Baba, and then immediately when your attack animation starts, you hold control and click the sarcophagus. Then once your character starts running towards the sarcophagus, once your true tile gets to tile 3, you click 4 while still holding control. Then once your true tile gets to 4, you click 5. Then after your true tile gets to 5, you hold shift instead of control and click the potion that you dropped. Then as soon as your true tile moves onto that potion, then you'll click Baba to attack and you'll have to let go of shift. So again, a lot of steps to do this, but once you get it down, then you're in the uh, cycle automatically. Not too bad. If you don't like this method, feel free to check out Kirby's guide. He uses a different method for setting up Red X. But once you do exactly what I explained, then you're back in the normal cycle that we talked about. And then you just shift click to walk under Baba right as you see her start her swipe animation. And again, you have to shift click so you don't attack her instead and you can click on the potion. Um, and then again, like I mentioned before, if you're cl shift clicking to walk under her right as she starts doing her shadow um, swipe attack animation, then you shouldn't get hit by the rocks. Um, and again, it's, it's the same as before. You walk two tiles in. When your true tile moves two times, that's when you click to attack Baba. And then once you're out, once Baba starts her attack animation, that's when you shift click to walk in. And it's really just the same thing. Um, one other thing I want to mention is that I'm flicking my piety here during this. That's just to save on prayer. And so this is pretty easy to do. The way you do it is after you click to attack Baba, once your true tile is one tile away from being out from under Baba, you'll click to turn on Piety. Then you just turn it off immediately once your true tile gets outside of Baba. And so if you do that, then you're going to keep turning Piety on and turning it off immediately after, and you'll be able to have Piety on for every attack without using any prayer. So again, pretty helpful. Also, you can dump Fang Specs into Baba too as well. So like I just turn on my Spec Bubble when I'm standing outside Baba in the downtime. And I, you can use a BGS here, but it does make it a little harder since you have to switch weapons, which you cannot do while standing under Baba because that cancels your red X action. But um, honestly, like I feel like accuracy against Baba is pretty good. So I just like using Fang Specs to do more damage instead of the BGS to lower defense. So that's really it for Baba. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna go through one full fight example, sped up a little bit just to kind of talk through it and you can see me like dealing with the boulders and everything but um yeah it, it, again this this is going to take some practice to learn but you can always go in in a low invocation fight so we're gonna go ahead and just do a full example kill so we're gonna walk into baba here i have all my melee gear equipped i first run to this left corner drop a potion move over one tile turn off my run and turn on my spec so i'm gonna thrall and then put my prayers on Attack Baba right after getting hit, move left and then right three, then left three, and then now I'm in the cycle and I'm just going to step in two tiles under her after attacking, and then click to attack her and step out. I'm dumping my specs into her as well because I just want to, you know, use all my spec energy and do a little bit more DPS. Alright, I have a, keep, I'm keeping an eye on her health and as it gets down to 66%, which is right now, you can see that I click off to the left and then equip my Bofa and Crystal Armor and turn my run on. I spam click to attack the boulder and run over to the empty gap, attack the next boulder, and then just run up to the one. Note that as I'm running up, I'm holding shift 
to make sure that I'm not accidentally clicking on a boulder as I'm running through the gaps. Then I run over to the X and drop a potion and then move back to the one. I turn off my run and switch my camera around. Then I, right after I hear the sound end for Baba's boulder throw, then I click to attack Baba, click the sarcophagus while holding control, then click four, five, and then shift click the potion, and then click to attack Baba. And now I'm back in the cycle. So now we're just gonna do this, and you can see I just stay in the cycle here and automatically dodge the rock since I'm clicking to shift click under Baba right after she starts her swipe animation. And that's going to be two thirds of her health down. So I'm getting knocked back down to the bottom. I equipped my crystal and Bofa and turned my run back on. Spam clicking the boulder, running to the middle, and then I can just run up through the middle there. If you don't lose any ticks like I did, then you're able to just shoot two and run on up through. Um, again, maybe don't recommend rushing it if you're still new to the boulder dash invocation, but it, it is really just practice and getting a feel for it. All right, and then now we're back in the cycle, did the same thing before to set it up. And I'm just gonna chill here and keep walking in and out, automatically dodging that rock. And that is it for the Baba fight. So again, it's, it's a bit challenging to learn Red X, but once you get it down, it's pretty straightforward. So now we're gonna leave that room. We're going to rearrange our inventory a little bit, and we're always going to choose life from the helpful spirit the second time. You know, gotta make those Catholics proud. I like to rearrange my supply pack too after doing that to where it's alternating um, one brew, one restore all the way through. So you can see in my inventory, I have the other dose of my salt, the one um, brew that's already in here, the two ambrosia, and then I still didn't use most of my prayer pots, so they're kind of cluttering up my inventory a bit. But um, yeah, in the supply pack, I have brew, restore, brew, restore, so on. And once we have that set up, we're ready to run into Warden. Um, you know, go ahead and have your BGS equipped too, because we're going to start off the fight with that. As you go into the Warden fight before you start, you want to make sure that you're really comfortable with the gear layout in your inventory because during phase two of the fight, you're going to have to be doing some very quick swapping between all three styles. And there are times where you're going to have to make sure you have all your melee gear equipped very quickly. So I like to have my um, gear kind of split up. You can see that I have my mage gear at the bottom and then my ranging gear at the top with all my melee equipped. But whatever works for you, just make sure you're comfortable with where all your gear is located. All right, now it's time for Warden. So this fight has four phases throughout it and it's pretty long, but we're just gonna kind of go through it slowly and explain everything. So first you wanna start off with your BGS. Typically what I'll do is I'll go ahead and click my spec bubble and turn on piety. Then I will click to use my salt and then BGS spec the obelisk. So you wanna to try to get at least 40 BGS damage in on the obelisk. More than that won't lower its defense anymore. So if you hit a 40 or more on your first hit, then I like to switch to my claws and summon a thrall. Uh, once I do my claw spec, then I equip my bofa and start ranging it. If you hit less than a 40, then go ahead and do a second BGS spec as well um, before switching to your bofa. Bofa and Fang do about the same DPS on the obelisk here. I think the Fang is slightly better, but when these UFOs come down, sometimes they surround the obelisk and you can't really get hits in with your Fang. So I like to just camp the bofa um, if you're using a blowpipe with Missouri, then that's actually even better DPS than the Bofa if you get a BGS spec off. So the way that this obelisk fight works is that it, uh, the, there's balls coming out of it charging up the two wardens. I always like to step in front of the balls to the warden on the left, and I'll explain that for a little bit later in the fight because that does affect phase three and four of the fight. I'll stand in front of the balls here, just tanking them until I take about 30 damage or so, and then I'll move back to the north side of the obelisk to get out of the way. Taking 30 damage is enough to stagger the UFOs enough to where it's pretty easy to dodge them. You just keep shooting the obelisk. There's going to be two sets of UFOs that come out, first the red ones and the yellow. They're always in an overlapping pattern uh, where they cover the whole arena together, but since you blocked some of the balls when you were standing in front of it, it offsets them. So you just stand directly below the obelisk for the red UFOs, and then once they stop spinning, then you can move to the left and stand on them and wait for the yellow UFOs to run out. You can flick rigor during this, but you don't really have to. You can just keep attacking. 
During phase one here, whenever my salt is about to get down to a multiple of 15, so you know, 745, 730, 715, and so on, I'll make sure that I'm brewed up to at least 100. So if my health is 99 or below, I'll go ahead and sip a brew dose right before my salt hits one of those 15 markers. You can even sip two doses right before as well, um, because the boost from the salt will heal up both of the stat drains. And the reason for that is that um, after you have both of these rounds of UFOs, then you're going to be tanking some balls coming out of each of the wardens, and there's no way to avoid this damage. The first ball will do 45 damage that's coming from the right side, then the one coming from the left side will do 30 damage after. And so you want to just keep making sure you're brewing back up to heal up every time your salt uh, is going to tick every 15 second interval. And then you can just keep your health high without having to brew your stats down. And then as you use your supplies, just right click to withdraw more from your pack. And you're just going to keep doing this. So th this is a pretty big drain on your supplies, but uh, you know, once you get past this obelisk, you don't take very much damage for the rest of the warden fight. Phase two a little bit, but not too much. I also want to call out if you did have to take power earlier because you didn't have any salts in chaos and you're lucky enough to have a liquid adrenaline, then you can use that at the start of the fight and then get a few claw specs in and do a lot of damage to the obelisk very quickly. Um, if the obelisk is taking a long time to die, you can resummon your thrall and just keep going. Just hope you don't run out of bruise. Um, all right, and so that's it for phase one. Phase two begins as the obelisk dies. Since we blocked the balls on the left side, the warden on the right will stand up to begin the fight. Initially, he'll be immune to both ranged and melee, so we'll have to equip all our mage gear. The way phase 2 works is that the warden walks around the room attacking you until you charge up its energy bar by attacking him. Once the bar fills up, he'll immediately go down on the ground and the core will be ejected. You need to switch to your melee gear as soon as this starts happening and pray piety as you start hitting the core. Note that you do not want to use your fang here. You'll use your 4 tick melee weapon, which would be your tent whip, your blade of salador, rapier, or inquisitor's mace. After meleeing the core for a bit, the warden will get back up and change what he's praying against. If before you had to attack with mage, now you'll use ranged instead, and vice versa, it'll just rotate back and forth. Uh, then you'll attack until the warden is downed again, and that process repeats until the core is dead. You should finish phase 2 in 3 downs of the warden every time. The first 3 downs, you can get off 6, 8, and then 10 melee attacks on the core respectively, assuming you don't lose time equipping all your melee gear. The core will always land in the direction the warden is facing when he goes down, right next to him. If the core lands on you, you'll get knocked back and lose a little bit of time, so make sure to not let that happen. On the last hit of every down, you can equip your BGS to get a bigger hit in before warden gets back up. This isn't required to have a 3 down phase 2, even in a 500 invocation raid with my gear, but if your gear isn't as good, it can definitely help. As the warden walks across the room, there's a few attacks he can do. He can pick his staff up by holding it vertically and then shoot a pink skull at you. You'll need to be praying protect from mage when the skull hits you or you'll take massive damage. He can also swing his arm throwing a rock at you. Again, you'll need to pray protect from range when the rock hits you, or you'll take massive damage. When he holds his staff vertically and it looks like he's going to launch a pink skull at you, he could also launch a few other things. If a big blue ball comes out, then your prayers will be, dis will be disabled and you'll need to turn on protect from uh, mage before the ball hits you. If a white arrow comes out, again your prayers are disabled and you'll need to pray ranged before it hits you. If a swinging red sword comes out, your prayers will be disabled and you'll need to pray melee before it hits you. Also, when he holds his staff vertically, he can shoot out a dark blob at you. And if you don't move before this hits you, you'll be rooted in place and then likely take massive damage from the obelisk's special attacks. Also, if Warden is not downed, then make sure not to walk within melee range because you can get hit hard by melee as well. As Warden is walking around doing all these attacks, the obelisk in the middle of the room continually charges up and releases three different special attacks. You'll need to avoid these as you move around the room during this phase of the fight because they do a lot of damage. All three special attacks can be dodged, but if you get hit by any, your prayers would be temporarily disabled, meaning you'll likely take huge damage from Warden's attacks. 
So the first special is a windmill of red dots that move counterclockwise around the room. Just don't run on the red dots and wait for them to move as you go around the room. Pretty straightforward. The second special is a line of red dots that will come out on the sides of the room and propagate outwards. As this happens, you can wait for the dots to come to you. When they're two tiles away from your current position, then just click where the dots currently are to move there. They'll have moved by the time you get there and you'll have successfully dodged the attack. The third special the obelisk will launch, um, it'll be pink deadly skulls that come across the arena and explode. So when one's launched, you'll hear a falling sound as well and see a shadow on the ground. You'll need to be at least four tiles away from the skull when it lands, or you'll take huge damage and have your prayers disabled. This is the hardest of the specials to dodge and it can take some practice. The louder the falling sound is, the closer the skull is to you, so that can help a lot. I like to stand near the edge um, off to the side just a bit and just react to the skulls as they're falling. If you mess up and get hit, you can always sip a dose of your ambrosia, that's what it's there for. Uh, note that if a skull is launched onto the location of your thrall, you won't see the shadow, but you'll still hear the sound. So if you hear a sound but don't see a shadow and your thrall is near you, you know that you need to move at least four tiles away from your thrall. So that's it for the phase two mechanics. Let's just go through and see an example kill. So as the obelisk dies here, I, I go ahead and put on all my maging gear. I also drag down my Tebow and um, Crystal Helm just to keep my inventory a little bit nicer. And then I put on Augury and summon a Mage Thrall. And then I double flick uh, Rapid Heal and start attacking. So first he uses a Skull attack, so I pray Mage. And then I usually just run back to this corner to lure him back here. And so the first special attack we got is the Red Windmill. So that's pretty easy. So I'm just going to run around and make sure I'm praying correctly against all of the Warden's attacks. And this should be pretty fine. I think the windmill makes just finishes up this quarter rotation and then it's done usually i can get the warden pretty low uh, or you know his bar almost filled up by the time the windmill's done so you can see i just need a couple more attacks here so i'm thinking okay i'm ready to get my melee gear on whenever he gets down and then i hit him here and i know that's going to down him so i just start equipping all my melee gear and put on uh, piety he was facing toward me so i knew the core was going to come out right in front of me and so I hit it six times here, so that's three, that's four, five, and six. And then I equip my ranging gear and turn on rigor and summon a range thrall. Again, I run back to the edge here and I just start T-bowing him. Again, just changing my prayers to account for his attacks. Whenever he holds his staff vertically, I do like to move one tile before I even know what it's going to be, because potentially, you know, it could be that attack that roots you in place. All right, he did his red dot special, and so you can see when they were two tiles away from me, I just moved onto it. And Tebow already got him downed again, so again, I just equip all my melee gear. He's facing me, so the core is coming out right in front. And so now I can get eight hits in for this down, so that was two. There's three, and in between hits, you can rearrange your inventory a little bit. Uh, maybe get out some potions, you know, just whatever you need to do. And then right before the last hit, I equip my BGS to get a harder hit in, and then I equip all my maging gear and summon a mage thrall. So again, I just pray against his attacks, try to keep my health high whenever um, it's getting close to a, you know, multiple of 15 for my uh, smelling salt. I tried to go ahead and sip a brew dose. And again, just running around the room, he used the windmill again. So not too bad. And he tried to root me in place there, but I moved out of the way. And just a few more hits and then hopefully he'll get downed again and then we can finish off phase two. So again, I'm looking at my inventory to make sure I know where all my melee gear is, and I do. The skulls are falling, so I moved four tiles away, but he got downed, so I'm equipping all my gear and putting piety on. He was facing toward the corner that time, so you can see that the core came out on the edge right here. And here I'm just, you know, kind of rearranging my inventory, getting out some supplies from my pack between attacks, and just making sure I have everything. And then I equip my BGS for the last hit and the core goes down. 
and that's really it for phase two um so it, it is a lot to learn there's a lot of different attacks and stuff but it's not too bad once you get the hang of it now we can move on to phase three phase three is the longest phase of warden by far but luckily it's pretty easy to avoid all damage in this phase warden continually slams the ground in a rhythmic pattern since we have the insanity invocation turned on these slam attacks are every three game ticks or 1.8 seconds when Warden is going to slam the left or the right side, he'll extend his arm and point downward at that side. Warden will hop up in the air before slamming both sides, and you'll need to be in the middle column of the room to avoid damage when that happens. So first, Warden will always slam the left side of the floor, then the right side, then both sides, and just repeat that over and over again throughout phase 3. I've marked three tiles in the middle of the room, corresponding to the safe spots for each of the slam attacks. You'll start off on the right tile, after the first slam move all the way to the left, then the middle, then the right again, and then back to left, and the cycle just repeats over and over. So make sure you get that order really ingrained into you, right, left, middle, right, etc. Essentially if you're not on the right tile, then next you can move one tile to the right. If you're already on the far right tile, then you need to move all the way back to the left before moving back right one tile for the next step and so on so after you see warden begin the attack animation and right before the floor shockwave begins that's when you can click to move to the next safe spot it'll take a bit of practice to get the timing down but it's not too bad typically right after moving to the next safe spot you'll want to click to attack warden again before having to move another time uh, since Warden's attacks are every three ticks though, you often won't be able to get another attack in before the next slam, and that's okay. Uh, when you're just learning, just focus on not getting hit, and if you attack slightly slower at first, that's totally okay. So at each 20% health interval, so you know 80%, 60%, 40%, 20%, Warden will stop slamming the floor for a bit and shoot out some pink skulls. The intention is for you to melee all the skulls quickly, or Warden will blast the floor with a huge shockwave killing you. If you hit all the skulls first with melee, they'll get sucked back up into Warden and he'll take a lot of damage. However, we're instead going to skip the skull blast, so this allows us to directly attack Warden a lot more, which gives us more points and then increases our purple chance greatly. Skipping the skull blast is actually easier than hitting all of them too. So when the skulls first shoot out, you'll want to run to this tile that I have marked over on the left. You'll need to be in the fifth column from the left of the room, so you could always be above or below the marked tile, but you have to be in that column. Then you'll spam click one of the faraway skulls with your bow equipped. As the skulls get sucked away, you keep spam clicking and you'll start running towards wherever you were clicking. This will time it perfectly so that you run through the blast and don't get hit. If you mess this up, you're just straight up dead. Nothing you can do. So you need to make sure you're accurately spam clicking one of the faraway skulls and starting from that fifth column on the left. After you skip the skulls, Warden will resume um, slamming the floor, continuing in the cycle wherever he was. It can be very hard to remember where the cycle was at, so what I do after skull skipping is I stand in the back of the room here. This gives me an extra tick to react to where Warden is slamming. So I'll attack Warden and wait here until I see this slam attack animation, then I'll click to move to the safe spot, reacting to it. And now we're back in the usual slamming cycle. When the second set of skulls comes out, Zabok's ghost will also appear. Zabok will then use both the jug and the rock attacks, where you need to pray magic and ranged respectively for the rest of the fight. Remember that the damage is calculated when the projectile hits you, so you have plenty of time to react to the attack style by changing your prayer. When the second skulls come out and Zabok first spawns, I'll first move to that tile that I have marked and open my prayer book. As soon as I see Zabok's attack, I'll pray correctly and then start spam clicking the skull, making sure to not misclick, because if you misclick then you're going to just die. When the third set of skulls comes out, Baba's ghost will also spawn and periodically drop rocks on you. You'll hear a falling sound and see some dust falling from above when a rock is going to fall on you, so it's easy enough to recognize it and move out of the way. This continues for the rest of the fight. When the third skulls come out, 
First, I run to my marked tile and I wait for Baba's falling rock sound. As soon as I hear Baba's falling rock sound, I move one tile down, making sure to stay in that fifth column from the left, and then I start spam clicking the faraway skull. Easy enough. When the fourth skulls come out, it can be challenging to time it, like when you need to dodge Baba's rocks and when to spam click the skulls. So what I do that works for me is as soon as you see the pink skulls appear on that fourth set, right after you see them come out, then you wait to hear two Baba rocks before spam clicking the skull. If you try spam clicking the skull too early, then Baba's rocks could crush you, dealing as much as 50 plus damage. And if you spam click the skull too late because you're trying to dodge Baba's rocks, then Warden's Blast will just kill you. So here's an example. As I see the pink skulls come out, um, I saw them come out right after I heard Baba's rock attack. So I need to wait for two more. Remember, you wait for two of the falling rock sounds after you see the pink skulls appear. So here's the first one. So I move out of the way and I'm just walking towards my uh, marked tile that I controlled clicked on. Then as soon as I hear the second falling rock sound right here, I click down one tile and then start spam clicking the skull, making sure, you know, I'm still in that fifth column from the left. And then that's easy enough. Occasionally you might get hit by Zabox um, attack if you don't have time to change your prayer, you know, as you're spam clicking, but that's pretty rare. You should be fine um, since his attack's pretty slow. Sometimes you might need to change your prayer as you start running after the skulls get sucked up. So remember for this fourth set of skulls, you'll need to make sure to listen for two falling rock sounds after you see the pink skulls appear. Then as you move down from that second falling rock sound, that's when you start spam clicking the skull. After the fourth skulls, you'll continue phase three as normal, dodging Baba's rocks and praying against Zabok's attacks until Warden gets down to 5% health, which will start phase four. Note that on phase three, your smelling salt should run out and this is okay and your stats will stay boosted as long as you don't brew down anymore after it runs out. So typically what I'll do on phase three is I'll brew up to 116 health before the salt wears off by brewing right before those 15 second salt intervals. And then right after I get up to 116 health, I'll periodically double click rapid heal to reset the drain bar on my HP for the rest of phase three. If you do this at least once a minute, your health will remain at 116. Since you shouldn't take any damage during phase three, you can then enter phase four with 116 health and still have your leftover stat boost from your prior salt. So the ambrosia that you have here, they're there for healing up without draining your salt boost. So if you take a lot of damage and your health drops below, you know, 60 or 70 or so, like late into phase three or on phase four, after your salt's worn off, then that's when you can sip an ambrosia. Um, you don't want to brew up after your salt's worn off because it will drain your stats and then it'll make the rest of the kill harder. So also after getting your health up to 116 in phase three, feel free to drop a brew on the ground to clear up some space in your inventory uh, to take out some more restores from your pack. Also phase three is the phase where having a Tebow over the Bofa makes the biggest difference. If you don't hit Warden with a BGS spec, then Tebow with Crystal, which is what I have, will be 28 seconds faster to kill Warden on average over the Bofo with Crystal. Um, if you start phase three with a BGS spec of 30 or more, then that gap increases to 30 seconds instead of 28. Um, luckily, since you don't take any damage during phase three and phase four with good play, Having the Tebow over the Bofa doesn't really matter other than saving you 30, or sec 30 seconds or so over the very long phase three. And if you do have full Missouri with Tebow, it's more like 50 seconds instead of 30. So now let's look at a sped up example of phase three where I'm gonna talk through my thought process and what I'm doing. As I finish phase two here, I equip my BGS and all my melee gear. I make sure to have my ranged gear at the bottom of my inventory too for an easy switch. So I'm going to start off phase three by praying piety, running to the right side, so I dodge the first slam and BGS specking warden. I hit for over 30 damage, so now I equip my range gear. And now you can see I'm just getting in that cycle of dodging his attacks. So remember, you start on the right side, after he slams, move left, 
move one tile to the right for the next slam, one tile to the right again, and then back left, and so on. So you just keep doing that cycle the whole time and attacking him in the middle. You can see I've also brewed my health up to 116 already. Um, and so that's that's going to be nice. Um, and I'm going to double flick rapid heal on my prayer book like that to keep that uh, health at 116. You can see the circle around the 116 going down. All right, so the first skulls came out. So I ran here to the marked tile and I'm just spam clicking this far away skull. As they got sucked up, I ran through the blast and didn't take any damage. So perfect. Then I stayed at the back of the room so I could see his attack and then dodge it. So now I'm just back in the cycle, um, again, just dodging all his attacks and using my Tebow. And like I said before, you know, you can do all this with Bofa. You don't need a Tebow by any means. You're not taking damage anyway, so if it takes you a little bit longer, it's no big deal. Um, so again, just, yeah, making sure to summon my Thralls too whenever they run out. Because the Thralls do a decent amount of extra damage, especially over the course of a very long fight like Phase 3 is. Um, again, also just like sipping my restores to keep my prayer high whenever, uh, just because, yeah, you want to make sure you don't run out of that. And then you can see I also drop a brew there on the floor, and that's just to clear up some space for when my restore runs out, I'll have an extra inventory slot. I take a supply out of my pack. Okay, we got the second skulls. So I go to my marked tile. I wait for Zabok. Okay, I pray magic when his projectile came out, and then I started spam clicking the skull. Easy enough. And now I'm waiting back here for Warden's attack. He did the center attack, so I don't need to move. And then now I'm back in the cycle. So again, you, uh, after the skulls, you wait at the back of the room and just react to whatever attack he does, and you should have time to move out of the way. So now we're just, you know, going through... Again, I'm just changing my prayers to pray against whatever Zabok's doing. You know, double flicking rapid heal like every once in a while when I remember. And just taking supplies out of my pack whenever I have space in my inventory. So this is, again, just, you know, pretty slow fight. Gonna take a while. Alright, and so now the third skulls are coming out. So I just walk over to this column with my marked tile. And then you can hear the Baba sound like I heard it there and then I start spam clicking the skull. You can see that I had to change my prayer from Zabok as I was running over to the center. Again reacting to Warden, just staying in the middle for that first slam and now I'm back in the cycle. And luckily, since you're having to move anyway to dodge Warden's attacks, Baba's rocks really aren't a problem. Uh, I'm kind of automatically dodging them just by running um, in the you know correct path that I normally do to dodge Warden's slams. So Baba's really not a threat here at all. It's just during those skull skipping parts that it can be a bit scary. So yeah, again, just back in the cycle and just gonna shoot him like this until he gets down to 20% health and that's when the fourth set of skulls will spawn. All right, and so the fourth set of skulls come out and then I heard a falling rock right after I saw the pink skulls. Then I heard the second one move down and start spam clicking and easy enough timed perfectly. So now I move down there to dodge his boulder and then react to Warden. So again, now I'm just back in the cycle and just going to keep doing this until he gets down to 5% health and that's going to be phase 4. So when, when he gets down to 5% health, he'll actually regenerate some of his health and stop slamming the floor. And so now we need to go ahead and talk about phase 4. As Warden gets down to 5% health, he'll heal back up to about 25% and stop slamming the floor. Instead, he'll continue to use um, lightning attacks on the floor for the rest of the fight. The tiles in the back row of the room will also get ripped up, hurting you if you're still standing on them, until there's only one row of tiles remaining. If you don't have a shadow, this phase can take a little while, so it's important you get decent at dodging the lightning attacks, while praying against Zabok and dodging Baba's rocks all at the same time on just the last row. The lightning attack starts by a tiny shadow appearing on a tile. The shadow will grow to full size and then soon after explode with lightning. These shadows seem to be a bit more likely to spawn wherever you're standing, so you always want to be ready to move. As the shadow on a tile has stopped growing and is full size, you can actually go ahead and click to move to that tile. By the time you get there, the lightning will have already blown up, 
So, um, you know, whenever you see a full-size shadow, you can click there and you know it'll be safe for a second or two. If you see two adjacent tiles where the shadow started growing on one right before the other, then what you can do is first move to the tile where the shadow is smaller, and then as the larger shadow gets to full size, click to move there. This will always be safe to do, and you'll never get hit by the lightning. Essentially for dodging the lightning, just try to move to a tile that has a full size shadow on it, since you know after the lightning goes off it's safe for a short time. Also at the start of phase 4, the warden's defense is restored, so you'll want to BGS spec once or twice again. The way I do this is as phase 4 starts, I control click to the back right side of the arena, and as I'm walking I equip my melee gear. I'll also summon a thrall back there, so that the thrall won't be blocking my vision on the last row of tiles. Then I'll enable my spec bubble and hit warden. If I hit less than a 60, and still have spec energy left, then I'll move to the left side of warden and BGS spec him again. Uh, for phase 4 you can lower his defense up to 60, so 60 damage of BGS. Then I'll control click backwards after finishing my BGS specs and re-equip my range gear. Typically I'll check my gear tab too, just quick to quickly glance and make sure I didn't miss any piece of ranging gear, since it's a bit hectic with everything going on. I know there's been times where I like accidentally didn't re-equip my crystal legs and had like my tacits on and that makes it take a lot longer. So then you, I'll just range Warden until he dies, essentially. Uh, no, you don't have to run up to the front row immediately. It can be a bit easier to stay in the middle of the room until the floor has mostly disappeared and just uh, slowly move up. For phase four, Zabok will actually launch a second projectile attack before the prior one hits you. So make sure to not change your prayer until the prior projectile makes contact with you. This can be really stressful and difficult to do when first learning, but believe me, it gets much, much easier with practice. As the floor is ripped up, you need to make your way to the last row, and you'll want to stay near the middle of the row when possible so you have more options to run either way to dodge the lightning and not get stuck on one side trapped by lightning blasts. To do this, I'll typically walk one direction clicking on tiles that have a full size shadow since I know they'll be safe for a second. Then when I see where the falling rock is, I'll often run two tiles past it to make sure I don't get hit. Um, you can run across it as long as your true tile never ends up on where the falling rock is, you're safe. It's very important you don't retrace your steps onto tiles you were just on, because the falling rock from Baba hits much harder than the lightning, so it's more important to not get hit by it. If you mess up and your health drops below 70 or so, I'd sip a dose of Ambrosia, because if you get hit by lightning and the falling rock at the same time, it can easily do 70 damage. And remember you don't want to drain your stats, so don't brew if possible. Also, it's more important to not take damage than it is to deal as much DPS as possible, so if you're not safe yet, don't attack. Like, you know, wait and move, uh, move to a safe area and then you can attack. So I'll typically attack after moving to a tile I know will be safe for a second, usually one that had a full shadow on it when I clicked onto it, because you know that you're not going to get another lightning for a second or two. So now let's go through an example kill for P4 so I can explain everything I'm doing. Alright, as I get this hit in here and start phase 4, I first control click back to the right and equip all my uh, melee gear, and then I run up and BGS spec him. I hit a 45, so I move to the side and do another BGS spec. Then I control click backwards and re-equip my ranging gear. All the while I'm praying correctly against, you know, all of Zabok's attacks. So now I move to the back of the room and I just start Tebowing Warden. Um, just trying to move onto tiles that I know are safe. So you can see that there's not that much lightning on the floor early on. Um, since, you know, there's a lot of clear tiles left to run on. So I'll like kind of make my way to the middle of the room clicking on tiles when I see their shadows full, and, you know, just kind of move back and forth. Again, make sure you're not retracing your steps, because you will get blown the fuck up by the falling rock. And so you can see, I'm, I'm kind of just keeping an eye on Zabok in my peripheral, peripheral vision here, and just making sure I keep track of where the um, projectiles are coming, and, you know, what style they're going to be so I know when to change between um, ranged and magic. So I'm going to re-talk through this last row part a bit just to 
you know, give you a bit more insight into what I'm doing here. But you can see I'm trying to stay in the middle, moving back and forth. All right, so let's back it up a bit and re-go over that last row part. So you can see I'm staying in the middle here and running to the side and, you know, just making sure I dodge the falling rock. I get kind of stuck here on the side and take one hit, which is totally fine. Then on this part right here, you can see there were two tiles next to each other where one of the shadows was smaller than the other. So I first run to the smaller shadow, and then after the bigger shadow is grown to full size, then I click there to run there. Um, which again, you know, that's going to be totally safe whenever you do that. Then I just continue, you know, moving back and forth, making sure not to step on tiles that I was just on, because I don't want to get blown up by the falling rock. So I'll move to one side typically, and then when it's safe, I'll move back to the other side when I see an opportunity. So it's again, it's it's going to take a lot of practice, but knowing that you can step on a tile when the shadow's full size and it's safe, and then if you have two next to each other, where one of the shadows is smaller than the other, then you step on the smaller shadow, and then once the other one's grown to full size, you step on that. Keeping those in mind and trying to stay in the middle, you'll definitely, you know, be a lot more successful. And you can see I actually got a purple from this kill, so let's open it up and see what we get. This is actually purple number 24 for me, so hopefully something good. And it is another light bearer, of course. That's that's just how it goes. That's unfortunate, but um, anyway, I hope this guide has helped. Um, you know, it's it's uh, been a lot of effort putting all this together. But, you know, if you have any further questions, feel free to let me know in the comments. And if you liked it, feel free to like and subscribe. Uh, if you ever want to catch me doing some TOA or anything else on Twitch, I've dropped my Twitch in the description, so feel free to give me a follow. And I'll be back soon with another TOA loot video. So take care, guys. Thanks for watching.